Hello everyone and welcome to this complete Python hacking tutorial. In this three and a half hour video, we will be coding our own web pen testing tools using Python. But before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to the team over at get.tech who sponsors the tutorials we do. I recently set out to create my own website to promote my courses and I needed to pick a domain that was memorable. My name is a bit of a mouthful and is often misspelled, so I went ahead and got myself jtdigital.tech. The most important facet of getting the perfect domain is that it is relevant to what you're about and is easily recallable. In other words, you want to focus on branding. If you're in tech and are building a business like mine, or you're working on a startup, blog, or business, there's no better option than a .tech domain. In fact, .tech domains have revolutionized the tech namespace over the last few years, and it's changed forever how tech entities choose to identify themselves on the net. A .tech domain can be used for anything tech-related. Awesome tech startups such as Shadow.tech, Aurora.tech, Edison.tech are using the domain extension to uniquely define what they are about. In fact, startups on .tech have raised over a billion dollars in funding. So if you are a programmer, developer, or just a tech enthusiast wanting to build the next big startup, portfolio, or personal website, go to go.tech slash jdtech or down to the link in the description and secure your own .tech domain. Again, for a limited time, use coupon code jdtech to get 90% off on one and five year domain registrations. Also, for a limited time, when you purchase a course bundle on my website, you will receive a free one-year domain promo code. The full Python hacking course is included in the Complete Ethical Hacking course bundle, where you will receive seven of the best-selling ethical hacking courses on the web. You can also use the coupon code YouTube to get the course directly on Udemy for the lowest price of $9.99. As always, I will include links to resources in the description of this video, as well as timestamps. So without further ado, let's get started. Hello everybody and welcome to the beginning of the new Python for Ethical Hacking course. Now, in this course we will be coding our own tools that we covered in the Ethical Hacking course. Now, for some of you that are coming basically first to this course and didn't uh, watch any other Ethical Hacking courses instead of this one, I'll make sure to make this course beginner friendly and explain everything as we go. We'll start off by actually installing our environment, setting up our Kali Linux machine, which if you are not a beginner and you actually watch some of the ethical hacking courses, you probably already have the Kali Linux machine installed. So you can skip the introductory part uh, and go right into the coding section. Now, what uh, we will be doing in this uh, course is, as it says, we will be coding some of our own tools that we will use for our ethical hacking attacks. Now, if you take, for example, any ethical hacking course, it consists of scanning, enumeration, uh, uh, basically exploitation, uh, backdoors, key loggers, uh, brute forcers, and any other attacks on the websites, for example. There are lots of other things as well. But all of those things you actually perform with tools that other people created. Right now, what we want to do is actually code some of our own tools and make them useful for our future attacks. So. Uh, we will start off by coding some of the uh, port uh, scanners. For example, we will try to create something similar to the nmap. We will start off our attack by scanning the port, scanning the target, checking out for the banners for the versions of, of uh, software running on the target system on an open port. And then we will proceed to actually exploitation and attacking, brute forcing SSH, for example, brute forcing FTP, and all other protocols as well. Uh, we will also code the uh, reverse shell, which if you're coming from my previous ethical hacking course for beginners to advance, uh, you probably already have uh, an idea what the reverse shell is, since I covered it in that course. But right now, what we will do with that reverse shell, we will take and add some different functions and try some different things with it, uh, as well as actually maintaining the everything we did in the ethical hacking course. Now, if you didn't watch that, don't worry, I will cover everything from the beginning uh, in that program and uh, we will also cover everything in great details as I will try to explain it the best even for the users who don't know anything about Python. Now the thing is I will not be actually showing you the uh, how to code in Python. Uh, basically this is not a Python course but 
I will, however, explain everything as we go and code our own tools. Since actually coding uh, or teaching you how to code in Python will take a lot of our time, I will tell you everything that we are going through in great details. So don't worry, even if you don't have any previous experience, you can still attend this course and you can learn a lot from it. Now, as I said, we will start off by actually creating our virtual environment. We will need the Kali Linux machine. Uh, we will need the VirtualBox program as well. Now, the Kali Linux machine is where we will actually run our attacks, where we will code our own tools, where we will compile them and run them. Uh, it is good to say, or I should say actually, that you can also run all of these attacks on Windows, or not run, you can actually code on Windows if you want to. If you, for example, have Python on Windows, you can actually code all of these tools in Windows environment. Now, if we run into something that can be run to the Windows environment, I will make sure to actually say that before we start coding. But the for you to best follow this course, I would uh, advise you to actually download Kali Linux, or if you have it, you can just run it up. For those of you who don't have it, I will show you in the next sections, or basically in the next videos, how you can download and install your Kali Linux machine. Right after that, we'll go straight into the port uh, port uh, scanning section where we'll teach or uh, where I will teach you how you can actually code your own port scanner. So that would be about it for this introductory part. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this course. I hope you will learn a lot from it, and I hope you will use it for uh, your own purposes as long as they are on the legal side. So that's another thing I should mention. Uh, basically, don't please don't use this for for anything that's not legal, such as scanning targets you do not own, such as attacking targets you do not have permission to attack, or basically anything that doesn't go into the legal side. So that would be about it. Hope I see you in the next lecture, where I will show you how you can download VirtualBox, the newest version, and Kali Linux 2019.8 version, or point A version. Pardon me. So, hope you enjoyed this introductory video, and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. And in this video, I will show you how you can actually download both VirtualBox and Kali Linux, the newest version. Uh, but if you have the older version, that one will work as well, I believe, uh, even though you actually want to keep everything updated. And updating your VirtualBox, for example, is always a good thing to do. So we'll download the latest version of both of these programs and we will try to make our own virtual machine. Now, as you can see right here, I already have both of them downloaded, which this is the installation file that we will use in order to install VirtualBox, which I have installed right here. And this is the Kali Linux 2019.1a version for the 64-bit machine. So, in order for you to actually download these two files, you need to go to these websites right here. So one of them is kali.org slash downloads. And there you will have the newest version of Kali Linux available at the current moment. Now, if, for example, in the time where you are watching this course, for uh, there is a different version other than 2019.1a, uh, feel free to download that one as well. And if you have any other problems regarding that version, being different than this one, feel free to post questions and I will be happy to answer them. So right now what we want to do is actually download the Kali Linux for our virtual machine. So as you can see right here, we have different types of Kali Linux models right here. We have the 64-bit, the Kali Linux LXDE 64-bit, the light version 32-bit and a bunch of other versions as well. Now the two versions that you should focus on are the Kali Linux 64-bit and Kali Linux 32-bit. Now, figure out what your main PC is. For example, my Windows 10 machine, which is this machine right here on which I am on currently, is a 64-bit machine, so I will download the Kali Linux 64-bit version. Now, we can see the size of it is 3.3 gigabytes, and we can download it both from the uh, browser and from the torrent. I will click here to download from the HTTP. Uh, this will take some time, that's why I already downloaded it before this video started, so I will not be downloading it now. 
you make sure to wait until all of these 3.2 gigabytes or 3 gigabytes are finished and after that you can continue with the downloading of VirtualBox. So once again if you have a 32-bit uh, PC download the 32-bit version. And after you do that you want to go to the VirtualBox website which is right here. So let me go one directory back. You just type in VirtualBox in your Google search bar and you just click on the first link that pops up which will be downloads Oracle VM VirtualBox. This will lead you to this page where you can actually pick which one you want to download. As we can see VirtualBox, the current version is 6.0.4. Uh, the platform packages, as we can see, they are separated for Windows hosts, OSX hosts, Linux distributions and Solaris hosts. Now make sure to pick uh, the version on which your main software or pardon me, main operating system is running. For me that is Windows since I am using Windows 10. So I'll just click right here on Windows hosts. And as you can see, it will start downloading the VirtualBox 6.0.4 version for me. Now this is a lot smaller file than the Kali Linux 2019 version, so this shouldn't take too much time to finish. But I already have both of these files, so I will actually close this and I will show you how you can install the VirtualBox uh, in this video. So, once both of these files are downloaded for you, uh, I can close this right now, we do not need it anymore. Uh, what you can do is actually paste them both on the desktop as it will be easier for you to find them. And right now we are only interested in this file right here. So this is the installation file for our virtual box. Now before I actually install it, let me close both of my machines. So I'll just close it like this. This is just a virtual machine and this is the actual interface of our virtual box, which I will show you just in a second right after I show you how you can install it. So what you want to do is double click the installation file. Uh, it will say preparing to install and basically all you want to do is just click next on every question it asks you. So right now if I click here next, this part right here is something you won't have. Now I have this because I already have VirtualBox installed so it asks me a modify, repair or remove installation since it can't really install it twice. So I will just remove my current VirtualBox I will just click here remove. Uh, as I said you will not have any of that. You can just proceed to the next step. I will click here yes. It will remove my virtual box currently as we can see right here. It should be removed any second. And right after that finishes I will show you the true process of install virtual box which will be basically just clicking next on every step. As we can see I don't longer have the virtual box right here so I will just click here finish. I will double click this once again and we can see I will just go next on every step so create start menu this if this is not checked for you uh, make sure to check it so it actually creates a desktop icon for you on the on your own desktop so you can actually easily navigate to the virtual box so we just click here next proceed with the installation yes uh, and then install this shouldn't take too long it will prompt you for the administrator password Basically, if you allow this application to make changes, you press yes, and this will download in just uh, 10 or 20 seconds or something like that, and you will be good to go. Then you can open the VirtualBox and we can proceed to the actual creation of our Kali Linux Virtual Machine. So it has finished. As we can see, we want to check right here Start Oracle VM VirtualBox after installation and click here Finish. Now. We wait for the window to open up, this same window you saw previously, and this is something that you won't really have. So all of these are virtual machines that I actually created before. Uh, you will not have any of these if you are currently uh, installing the VirtualBox for the first time. If you are not, you're, if you already have a Linux machine and VirtualBox installed, you're probably skipping this section anyway. So uh, all you have to do right now is actually click here on the new button right here. Now this new button right here basically presents the new virtual machine. So once you click on this, it will ask you for some of the questions in order to create for you the new virtual machine that you will use. So right here, you can name the machine anything you want. This is basically the name of your machine. I will name it Python Ethical Hacking 
doesn't even matter, you can name it anything you want. What I will do right here is this is the important part. In the type, uh, you want to select the Linux since we are using the Linux operating system. And right here, you will have a bunch of these options for the Linux version and you want to select the Debian 64-bit. Now, if you installed Kali Linux 64-bit version, you select here Debian 64-bit. If you install Kali Linux 32-bit version, you want to select here Debian 32-bit since Kali Linux is actually based on Debian. That's why we are selecting Debian right here. So once you make sure everything is good, you have the type Linux, the version Debian, and then 64 or 32-bit. You gave it a name, and this is the folder where the machine will be saved. You proceed to the next step. Now, the next step is basically the memory size, which you will give to your virtual machine. Now, this is basically your RAM memory. So for example, as you can see right here, I have eight gigabytes of RAM memory on this PC, and I want to choose how much RAM memory I want to give to my virtual machine. Now, what this means is basically, uh, if you have eight gigabytes like me, and you give two gigabytes to your virtual machine, every time you start up your virtual machine, the virtual machine will actually occupy two gigabytes of your RAM. So for your main machine, there will be left only six gigabytes. So make sure to not select too much right here, or it might actually make your uh, PC crash. For example, if I just type here eight gigabytes, it will not even open the machine since there will be no memory left for my main PC. So one, uh, I would advise you to put like two gigabytes at least, uh, you can go with one as well, I believe, but uh, you don't really want the machine to run that slow. So all you want to do is just select the memory that you're capable of giving to the virtual machine. For example, if you have four gigabytes, you can technically give two gigabytes for, to, for the virtual machine, but it might be running a little bit slower since you only have two gigabytes left for the main machine. But it doesn't really matter. For now on, we just want to select the appropriate uh, memory for our virtual machine, click here next, and you want to select create a virtual hard disk now, and click here create. It will ask you what file type of the hard disk you want, you just click here next, which is selected as VirtualBox, uh, VirtualBox disk image, dynamically allocated, what this means basically dynamically allocated, uh, it will not fill up the space as you use the machine. Now the fixed size if you, for example, give 50 gigabytes of your hard disk memory to this virtual machine, it will already make those 50 gigabytes as full. You will not be able to use them or uh, to do anything with them unless you delete the virtual machine itself. The dynamically allocated will, however, not uh, take any memory uh, right now, but if you actually use it, it can take up to 50 gigabytes of memory. So click here next. I will just leave it on dynamically allocated since it creates it faster. And all it asks right here is the confirmation of the name and the amount of memory you want to give it from your hard disk. Now, if your hard disk is, for example, one terabyte, you can give it uh, 30, 20, 40 gigabytes, however you want. Make sure to not go below 20 gigabytes. So I will give this machine around 30 gigabytes of memory. So 32, it doesn't even matter. I will click here on create. And right now, as we can see right here, we have Python ethical hacking which has Debian 64-bit icon right here. You can see the specs of our uh, virtual machine right here. And we will continue to actually install in Kali Linux itself in the next video. So, hope everything went right for you. Uh, we will continue with adding our ISO file that we received from the Kali Linux install uh, pardon me, downloading process. And we will use it in order to run our operating system on this virtual machine that we just created. So hope you enjoyed this video and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to the third video of our introductory part. Right now what we want to do is install our Kali Linux machine and get it to actually work. Now this is a process that can take a little bit of time since the installation process takes around 30 to 40 minutes on average. But we need, this is something that we need to do in order to actually have our hacking environment set up. So what you want to do is start up your VirtualBox. So just click on the double icon right here. If you didn't install VirtualBox, make sure to check out previous video in order to see how to do that. Uh, this installation file, you do not need it anymore. You can just delete it and start up your VirtualBox. 
So right now we can see that right here we have our Python ethical hacking machine. Uh, basically all you have to do right now is actually add this ISO file to the virtual machine storage before actually starting up the machine with this button. So how can we do that? We can do that by selecting the virtual machine and then going to the settings right here. So right here you will see a bunch of different settings for our virtual machine such as system settings, display storage, audio, network, serial ports, USB, and so on and so on. So let us actually go uh, through these settings right here in order to see if everything is correct. So this is something we specified in previous video. This right here is not really important to us. On the system part, you can change your RAM memory if you want once again. If you think you gave it too much or too little, you can change it right here. The processor part is something that we didn't see in the previous video. Uh, basically this part right here allows you to actually give your virtual machine more CPU cores. For example, it will by default leave your uh, machine on the one CPU core, but you can, for example, if you have a really good PC with like six or eight cores, you can just give it four or three or anything, any number you want, uh, but make sure to not give it too much as it will leave a little for your main PC. So what I will do, I will just leave it on one. And this right here is basically the percentage of core being used for your virtual machine. So if you just leave it on one and drop this to 50%, for example, what this will do, the virtual machine will only use the 50% of your one core, which is not enough. Or maybe it even is, I never tried it. Uh, what I will do is I will leave one core to be used by our virtual machine and I will give it 100% of power from that core. The acceleration is something that we do not care about, so make sure to check this if this is okay. This one as well. And next thing we want to do is go to the storage. Here we will add our Kali Linux ISO file. So what we want to do is first of all delete the empty attachment right here. So remove it, remove, and under the controller IDE right here you will have this disk with a plus right here. All you want to do right now is actually just uh, uh, click on this. So click on the disk with a plus. It will ask you, do you want to choose disk or leave empty? We want to choose the disk that we want to use. And what this disk is, is basically it is our uh, ISO file that we want to run as an operating system. So if you can't see it right here, which you most likely won't be able to see it, just click here on the add button right here. It will lead you to your Explorer where you can navigate to the desktop or wherever you save this ISO file and select it. So it is right here. I will click here open and I will double click it right here. As we can see uh, right now we have the Cal Linux 2019.1a AMD 64 bit version .iso. Once you select all of that uh, you can click here OK. The network part of settings we will cover later on after the installation, but for now on we are good to go, so just click here OK. Once you finish that, you uh, you are good to go and you can actually start up your virtual machine running Kali Linux. So just click here on this green arrow right here, which says Start. Uh, it will open up this window, which is our virtual machine. As it says right here, VirtualBox version 6.0. And all we want to do right now is actually se select either one of these two options. So graphical install or install. Now you can proceed to go with any of these two you want. Basically they are the same, just the graphical install is a little bit prettier. But I am used to going with the regular installation. So I will just click here enter on the install. Now before we continue, you might have noticed, let me just enlarge this so you can see it better. You might have noticed that we don't actually, uh, we can't actually navigate with our mouse anymore. So in the installation process, you can navigate only with the uh, arrows and with the enter. So click here, either graphical install or regular install. And this will start the process of installation of Cal Linux for us. Now, during this process, it will ask a bunch of questions, which I will make sure to show you what you need to answer in order to get this to work correctly. So this is something that really is up to you. So you can select any language you want. I will just proceed here with the English. And the select your location is also up to you. Select your own location, or it doesn't even have to be your own location. I will just select your United States, even though I am not from the United States, I'm from Europe. 
And uh, this is the configuration of your keyboard. So this can be a little bit tricky if you're used to, for example, QWERTY part and not QWERT Z. So make sure to check that out before continuing. Or for example, if you have a different type of keyboard configuration, you can select it right here as there are a bunch of others as well. Uh, what I will do is I will go with the American English and this will finish up with the questions currently. Right now, as we can see right here, it is loading some additional components. So we will let this run. And hopefully our processor installation goes without any errors. Now, once again, if you encounter any errors, make sure to post a question and I will be gladly answering you uh, on your problem. So we can see configuring has finished. And right now it asks us configure the network. Please answer the, uh, please enter the host name for this system. The host name is a single word that identifies your system to the network. If you don't know what your host name should be, consult your network administrator. If you're setting up your own home network, you can make something up here. Now this is completely up to you what name you will specify right here. I will just leave it as Kali. Uh, basically, this is just something that will pop up in your terminal every time you open it. So you can just select, type here anything you want. I will just go with Kali. So navigate with your arrows to continue and press here enter. It will ask you to configure the domain name as well, which we do not need at the moment. So right now I will just leave this empty and click continue here as well. So right now it will ask you for your root password. Now here you basically type any password you want, make sure to remember it or else you will not be able to log in into your root account on Kali Linux machine. So just type here anything you want. In my case, I will just use test one, two, three, four. As you can see, if I go on to the show password in clear, oops. Yeah, arrows don't seem to work. Okay, so here it is. You need to press space bar in order to show password in clear. So test one, two, three, four, and I will go to the continue where it will ask me to actually re-enter the password. So re-enter once again, test one, two, three, four, and go to the continue. The configure the clock. So basically this is also optional. I mean, you do not really need to select uh, your own time zone. You can just go with anything you want, but if you want to have the correct time and everything correctly, you can just specify the correct settings. So I'll just go here with Eastern. And let's see what will pop up next. I believe right now it might actually start the, oh, oh, there is the partition disk. I forgot about this part. So all you want to do right now is actually just click here, enter or uh, enter on the guided use entire disk. Now the encrypted disk we will not install since it is not really needed for this course. So we will just go with the guide use entire disk. Click here, enter. It will select these two portion and you will most likely have only this one disk that you selected, which is around 30 gigabytes as you remember uh, when I specified it. So just click enter on that one. And for the this part right here, you want to select the all files in one partition. As it says right here, it is recommended for new users. And if you're watching this video, you're most likely a new user of this. So you want to go with this so it doesn't present us any other problems. So just select here all files in one partition, click enter. And right here, click finish partitioning and write changes to the disk. What this will do is it will ask us once again, if we want to, if we are sure we want to write the changes to the disk, as it says right here, if you continue, the changes list below will be written to the disks. Now, don't worry, this is only referring to your hard disk that you specified in the creation of virtual machine, which is only 30 gigabytes if you specified it like me. So this will only change the, or write changes to that section of your hard disk. So write changes, yes and this will actually start the installation itself. So what we will do, we will let this run and I will see you as soon as a question pops up or anything that we need to answer in order to continue the installation process. So here we are at our first question that popped up, which is the configuration of the package manager. Now it says right here, a network mirror can be used to supplement the software that is included on the CD-ROM. This may also take newer versions of software available. Now what you want to go right here is select here, yes, use a network mirror. So click here on yes. 
And the next part right here is the HTTP proxy information, which we do not really need to specify. So right here, we can only just continue without typing in anything right there. Now, what this will do is it will actually configure the APT, as it says right here, for a few moments. And then uh, soon, uh, I believe, it will prompt us with the grub bootloader question, where we actually want to select yes and install the uh, grub bootloader to the master boot record. Now, don't worry, I will read it out loud once the question pops up and I will uh, also tell you what you need to do. And I believe right after that, that will be the last question that will pop up and the process of the installation of Kali Linux will finish then and we can put up into our new Kali Linux machine. So let's just wait for this configuration of the APT to finish and then we will continue. So let's wait for this. So here it is, I believe right now it will prompt us with the question. I'm not really sure why the screen is blue, but hopefully it will go away soon and we will get our question prompted. So here it is, instantly grab bootloader, retrieving file one out of three, and I believe right now it will prompt us with that question I was talking about. And here is the question. So uh, you can read it if you want, or I will read it right now. As it says, it seems that this new installation is the only operating system on this computer. If so, it should be safe to install the grub bootloader to the master boot record of your first hard drive. Now you might be asking, well, this isn't really our first installation operating system. You have your main Windows machine, for example, system. But this is not referring to that. It does not know that it is run as a virtual machine. So basically, uh, for this virtual machine, this is the first operating system, and we want to actually install the uh, grub bootloader to the master boot record. So right here, uh, select here yes, and press enter. And all we want to do right here is basically device for the bootloader location, scroll down to the slash dev slash SDA, and click here enter as well. Now this will continue, or basically this will finish the installation of group, grub bootloader. And this will also, also finish the installation of our Kali Linux machine. This is the last part, as it says right here, finishing the installation. Now, what it might actually do is it might prompt us with something like unplug your USB drive the, after a certain point of this installation. But we really do not want to do anything there since it is referring to anyone installing this operating system on a main PC as a main operating system because they would most likely be doing it via USB drive with the burnt disk image on that USB drive. But since we are not doing that at the moment, and since we are not really installing a real main operating system, instead we are installing a virtual machine operating system, we will just proceed with that question if we even get it prompted. So let's wait for this installation part to finish. And here it is, installation is complete, so it is time to boot into your new system, make sure to remove the installation media, we don't care about this, just click here, continue, finishing the installation, and as soon as this finishes, we will be able to start our Kali Linux machine. I believe this will not take more than a minute or two, so don't worry, the longest part of our installation has actually been finished already, which was the installation part itself, and this is just some additional packages it needs to install or configure in order for our Kali Linux machine to actually start. So here it is finished. Right now we are rebooting or booting into our Kali Linux machine. Right here you can just let this run by itself or you can press enter. It will load some of the components and it will start up our Kali Linux machine. Now I need to show you how you can log in since if this is your first time, which it most likely is, uh, you need to know the username and you will also need to know the password that you specified in the installation process. So make sure to not forget that the username for the logging in into the root, root account of Kali Linux is basically just root. So you just type under the username section root. It will be the same for everyone. And after that, it will prompt you for a password where you actually just type the password that you specified in the installation process itself. So right now we will wait for that uh, window to or basically for that login to get prompted to us. And then we will specify everything we need in order to log in. So he, this is the uh, login screen of the Kali Linux machine. Uh, 
you just type under the username root and under the password you just type basically the password that you specified in the installation which in my case it is test1234 press enter and it will prompt you with your desktop for your Kali Linux machine now I will not be explaining in details uh, the environment of Kali Linux itself since this course is not really aimed towards that so with a little bit of actually exploring uh, additional videos or additional parts of the internet you can actually find out a lot of great things about Kali Linux if you're new to it of course I will make sure to explain everything that we use and everything that we need in order to actually make our programs and also if you might notice right now since we are in the, at the login screen you might notice that our screen isn't really that big it is only squared to this part right here we want to make sure that our Kali Linux machine is full screen so we can get the full quality of this video and we do not need to really watch a small screen display so we will do, I will show you that in the next video uh, that is something that you should really do in order to get the best out of this installation so that would be about it as we can see right now we have our Kali Linux machine opened and I will show you how to make it full screen in the next video as well as some additional stuff you might need to do so, hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next lecture. Bye! Hello everybody and welcome back. And in this tutorial, I just want to show you how you can make your Kali Linux machine a full screen. Now, I am record I already recorded this video, but for some reason the video didn't have audio on it. So, you might be asking, why are you not just redoing the video and showing us everything from the beginning? Well, basically, uh, something really interesting happened, and by interesting, I mean there was an error that occurred, and I was still able to get the full screen mode in Kali Linux, but I just want to show you how you can get it, and uh, if you encounter the same error, what you need to do in order to actually get your Kali Linux into the full screen mode. Now, that's why I will be running just the, the actual uh, video of the screen recording that I saved while I was trying to make my Kali Linux full screen. Uh, I will narr narrate over it, don't worry, let me just find which one was it. I believe it was the 23 minutes or something like that, so it was a rather long video, so here it is. And let me just put this into the full screen mode. So as you can see right now, I already, uh, or not already, I still have the regular Kali Linux small box machine. Uh, it's still not full screen and let me just show you what I did in order to get it to the full screen. So I opened up my terminal as you can see right here. So just click on the icon uh, on the left right here in order to do that, which you should know by now. Open your terminal and here I'm typing the command prompt in order to open my command prompt on Windows so I can show you what the terminal actually is in Linux. So basically both of these are actually the same. The command prompt which you might have actually encountered sometime on your Windows machine is basically just a program that allows you to execute system commands. While well, basically the terminal in Linux is the actual same thing. Just this is in Windows and this is in Linux system. So let us continue. Let's see what else I showed right here, which I can't really remember. I will just go over every step I did in order to get the Kali Linux machine to be full screen. So let me just see. I opened up my Firefox. And yeah, the reason why I opened Firefox is because we have to find the uh, repository on the Kali Linux website, uh, which allows us to specify the link in our sources.list file. Now, for those of you who are new, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but don't worry, this process, I will show the entire process of actually doing it. So, what, what I did is basically I just opened the Firefox, then I closed these basically windows, these two windows that pop up by default, and I just want to actually go to the official Kali Linux uh, website. So, as you can see, I'm typing right here Kali repositories, so I just type reposi and forgot even to finish the sentence but it doesn't even matter what you need to type in Google search bar is Kali repositories on your Kali Linux machine. Once you do that you will go basically to the first link which is Kali docs minus Kali Linux which is on the official site of Kali Linux. As you can see this is the link 
and all you want to actually find is the resources that we want to, or puzzle me, the repositories that we want to actually specify in our uh, apt sources.list file. And those repositories, as you can see, I'm trying to find them. Here they are. You need to actually get the Kali rolling repository, as I am specifying right here. So you just go down, scroll down, and copy this part right here. Copy the entire link. As we can see, currently I am copying it. So we can specify it in our sources.list file. Then let me just go right here. So I opened after that my terminal. And right now what I will do is I will navigate to the sources.list file. Currently I am in the root directory. And I will navigate with the command called cd. As we can see this ls command, once you type it in your terminal on Kali Linux, it will just link, uh, list the uh, directories in the current directory. So these are all the folders in my root directory. And with this ct, or pardon me, cd at capt, I'm changing my directory to the at capt directory. And right now, if we specify ls right once again, you can see in that directory, here is our sources.list file that we need. Now let me just go a little bit back. So what I did right here is I used the command nano sources.list. And what nano command does basically is it opens something similar to the notepad so you can edit the file in there. It is a program that comes pre-installed in Kali Linux and you can use it to nano any program, any file, any text file in order to see its contents and in order to change its contents. So we want to nano the sources.list file which we found in the slash at c slash apt directory which we navigated with this command cd at c apt. Once we open that file you will see that this is specified in that file. Now we already have the the thing that we copied, as we can see, if I paste the thing that I copied from the Kali Linux official website, you can see that these two links are the same. Now, if, if in your case they are not the same, what you want to do is you want to actually uh, delete one, or not delete one, you want to paste the one that we copied, uh, in case that the, 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 the one that I opened right here is not present. But since you can see in my case I already have two the same links, so I will not need this one, so as you can see right now, I will delete it from here. All these other links that are under the hashtag are the links that won't be used. And don't remove the hashtags from them since we don't really need them currently. So all you have to do right now in order to save this, so as you can see I'm just showing you what hashtag does. You need to leave it like this, so with one link. You want to control O to save. Let me just see when do I do that, so it should be control O to save, then enter, then control X to exit the program. So let's go a little bit forward, as we can see I press control O, it asks me file name to write, sources.list, you press there enter, and then you control X to exit. So let me just go forward, and as we can see, uh, right after you do that, this is the command that you want to run, apt minus get and then update. So once you run that, it will take a few seconds to finish, so let me just move that. As we can see it finished, I use the clear command to clear my screen, which is an optional, you don't really need to use it. And the next thing I do is apt install linux minus headers. Now let me just see wh uh, when I write the full command right here, so I will explain everything this command does, even though it doesn't really matter, you just need to run it in order to install the headers. And basically what this command does is it installs the Linux headers currently needed for our Kali Linux version. This command uname-r, if typed in terminal, will basically just print out the, the version of headers needed, or the version of headers that are currently on your Kali Linux machine. But with this command I specify to install uh, the headers that are already made for my Kali Linux version with this command right here. So we let this run, it shouldn't take too long. Oh yes, here is the error that I encountered, which is basically uh, a lock appeared. Uh, anytime you actually get this error during the installation of any program or apt update and upgrade, it will say it could not get lock uh, and then the path to the lock. Now there are three locks 
And in case you get this error, all you want to do is actually delete all these three locks. Now if you don't get this error, don't worry, you might not even get this error, but in my case I did get, so I had to delete all of those three locks. The first one is specified with this path right here, so you just use the rm command, which stands for remove, and then you just copy this path right here, and paste it after the rm. This will delete the lock at that path, and then you can proceed to download. But as you can see, there will be a second lock that will appear, on different path and you will need to actually delete that one as well. So as we can see I remove the lock right now and I try once again and right here you see that I actually have another lock on different path so you just copy this path as well and you perform the same rm command in order to remove that lock. As we can see here I am explaining that so let us remove it. As we can see right now I removed it and I tried to run the apt install in Linux headers once again and this is where I got the another error for the third lock and last lock which you need to delete before you actually are able to download this. Now the lock is at this file so you just copy this file, you specify rm once again and delete the lock at that path. And right now if you run the apt install Linux headers once again, you will be good to go and you will be able to actually download them in case you don't have them. Now in my case, let me just go this way forward, in my case it was already the newest version so it didn't have to download. Now let me see what I did next. So I will just forward this. Okay, so right here, after that, what I did is basically I went to my... Let me just show you because... I already passed it. So after you install the Linux headers, where you want to go is you want to go right here to the devices. So let me just let this run. So devices. Then you want to insert guest edition CD image. So click on that. As we can see, I clicked right here. And it will prompt with this window saying contains software intended to be automatically started, would you like to run it? What you want to do is press cancel right here since we do not want to automatically run it because it won't really work. So what you want to do is run a few commands and basically install the VirtualBox VS Edition themselves and you will be good to go and be able to actually get the full screen Kali Linux. As we can see right now, I'm installing some VirtualBox guest uh, utilities, as I believe that I did that, so let me just see right here. apt get install VirtualBox and then uh, minus guest minus utils. So you just press here Y. If it asks you do you want to continue, you press here Y to, for yes and N for no. And it will download those utilities for you. So let's go forward. Not really sure how long this took, it took quite some time, so a few minutes. It didn't prompt any questions during the installation. And right after you do that, what I did, oops, let me go one step back. So right after I did that, I changed my directory to this directory. So I changed my directory to media, and from there I want to change my directory to CD-ROM0. Since there, since there is where my uh, VirtualBox uh, you, uh, guest editions are, which I imported previously with devices and then insert VirtualBox guest editions. So I go there, I will probably type CD, okay, so here it is. And then we can see a bunch of programs right here. Uh, we, well, the program that we are interested in is the VBox Linux editions.run. All of the other programs, as you can see, these .exe programs are for uh, are for Windows. So you want to copy the VBox Linux editions.run, and what you want to do is basically just run that file. So as we can see, in order to run that file, you need to type sh and then dot slash and then the name of the file itself. Then you can press enter and this will start actually downloading or installing the VirtualBox yes editions for you. It says do you wish to continue, I just pressed here yes and it started installing it. So let me just forward this so we don't wait for the installation. Okay, so it is still installing and here is the error that I actually got right after it. As it says, VBox client failed to register resizing support. Now this is the error that you might get or you might not get 
basically, uh, as I was saying in this video, but the other didn't really record it, I was saying that the installing of the VirtualBox guest editions is most likely different from for every Cal Linux version, and it really uh, often gives some errors back. But the best thing you can do is actually just reboot after the error, and it might actually even work after that. It probably will work, or unless you actually specified something wrongly in the commands and you actually get a real error. This is not something that we should be worried about, so if you get the same thing right here, don't be worried. As you can see right now, all I did was just reboot the machine with the reboot command. So let me just show you. Let me just show you. So I typed reboot. And now my PC, or oh, pardon me, my Cal Linux machine will actually restart. As soon as it boots, you can see that it actually booted up in the full screen mode. And they get prompted the login screen in the full screen mode. So as long as you do all of the commands that I did in this video uh, in the same order, even if you get that error, don't worry, just restart your Cal Linux machine and you will have the full screen mode enabled. As we can see, once I log in, my desktop and everything else is in the full screen mode. So that would be about it for the actual uh, going full screen in Kali Linux video. Uh, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, basically, I, as I said, I didn't really redo the entire process itself since uh, I just wanted to show you in case you get the error as well, so you know what you need to do. So that would be about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody, and welcome back. And in the previous videos, I showed you how you can actually install VirtualBox, Kali Linux, and your VirtualBox box guest editions in order to have our Kali Linux machine in full screen mode. So right now, we can actually start to introduce ourselves uh, with the Python environment in Kali Linux. So this is the similar desktop to before, to in the previous video. And right now, just open up your terminal. Uh, basically, you can enlarge it if you want to. It doesn't even matter. I will zoom in just in, in case so you can actually see it a little bit better, which I will do with the view and then zoom in right here. It just uh, makes you uh, actually see this better and in larger letters. What I will do right now is I will actually make my uh, terminal background not transparent so you can basically see the code better once we actually start coding. So I will do that with the edit part, then preferences. Then let me just find it. Okay, so it is under color section right here, transparent background, you can change it right here. I will just leave it to be completely black. Now you can leave it anything you want. You can make it fully transparent. You can make it different colors and so on and so on. But this is not really the part of our course. So all we have to do right now is actually open up the Python in order to show you the Python interpreter and how you can actually use Python in order to create programs in Kali Linux environment. So first of all, before we do any of that, Let's ask ourselves, why are we even doing this? Why are we coding our own tools? Why are we using Python and not some other programming languages? Well, basically, the idea behind actually teaching people how they can write their own tools is to differentiate you from basically anyone that's using the tools. Now, it is in the hacker world referring to as a script kitty, is someone that always uses different people's tools and doesn't really know how they work in the background. Now, programming knowledge and coding those tools actually gives you an in-depth view and actually a better understanding of how those tools work and how does the process of attacking really work. And also, one more thing, those tools that you use from other people, that you either download from GitHub or that you actually get from the Kali Linux itself, since Kali Linux comes pre-installed with a bunch of different hacking tools, which will not be the part of this course, uh, some of those tools will break some time. So what you want to do in case some of those tools break and you need them, you can learn to code them yourself and use them whenever you actually want. And for example, some of the tools are not really uh, specified for a certain type of attack. So you can actually, with your programming knowledge and hacking knowledge, combine those two and actually create a tool that will be specifically for a certain attack, which you can't really do if you can't really code or you don't need know uh, how to code any hacking tools. You only know how to use tools from different people. Now, 
as I said before, this will also give you a better understanding of what is happening behind the scenes, since you will be the one that is actually coding the attack itself. Now, the reason why we are using Python is basically from two reasons. First of all, the Python is the, you can say, the hacker's uh, programming language, since it is a scripting language and it allows us to create uh, co uh, programs really fast. For example, C is a low-level language, and anything we actually code in Python in this course will take a lot longer or significantly longer to code in C. Uh, Python is easier, and also, uh, basically, I chose this language because uh, I will not be teaching you the programming itself. Uh, if you can, if you are in the position to, please, you can just take any a Python programming course, beginner course, it doesn't even matter, you can just look at some of the videos at YouTube, so you can see the syntax for the Python, you will understand all of this a little bit better and easier, but don't worry if you don't want to or don't have time to do that, I will explain everything as well, just not in that detail, since we will be mostly, mostly focusing on the hacking part of the code itself. So, uh, in order for us to actually open Python in uh, Kali Linux, you just open up your terminal as we did right here, and all you have to do is just type Python. Now what this will do is it will open up the Python interpreter right here, where we can actually execute these uh, commands, or basically execute the program itself. Now Python interpreter is not really something that we will use uh, in order to make our programs, but you can also always use it in order to test a certain part of the program since it gives you the error right away. For example, there is a import function called import OS, which imports a library, and as you can see, if something like this happens right here, which you get three error and then three error once again, it means it executed properly. But if I try to import something that doesn't resist, uh, exist, which is OSS, it will give me a name saying no module named OSS. So this is Python interpreter, we can use it just to simply check our syntax, if it is correct or not, before actually putting it in the program itself. But another thing you might actually notice is that this is the Python 2.7.15+. plus. So, uh, basically this is the Python 2. Uh, the Python 3 you can open, let me just show you how, with the Python and then 3. As we can see Python 2, we open with just simply typing Python, and Python 3 interpreter we can all open with typing Python 3, which will lead to the same command prompt with these three arrows to the right, but this will be the Python version 3.6.8. So that's, that is something you want to differentiate. That is how you can open Python, that is how you can use Python interpreter. Now let's see how we can actually write a simple Hello World program and save it and actually execute it from our terminal. We do not want to use the Python interpreter, we actually want to create a program ourselves. So here, if you just type here ls, which stands for listing directories in the current directory in which we are, uh, basically in order to check in which directory you are, you just type here pwd, it will print working directory, as it says right here, P stands, for, P stands for print, W for working, and D for the directory. We are currently in the root directory, which is good, we want to be there. As you remember from the previous videos, you can actually navigate through the directories with the CD command. So for example, if you wanted to go to the documents, you could just type CD documents, press enter, and now if you just type PWD once again, we are in the slash root slash documents directory. But we want to go one directory back, which we can do with cd and then two dots, it leads you one directory back, which will lead us right back to our root directory. Right now, what we want to do is actually create the directory where we will actually save our Python programs that we will code. So, let us make a directory. Now, in order to make a directory in a simple Kali Linux environment, you just type in your terminal mkdir, and then the name of the directory you want to create, which can be anything. In my case, it will be Python programs, uh, because we are going to make Python programs and save them in that directory. You just press here enter, and if you just type here ls once again, we can see right now we have the Python programs directory as well as other directories that were there before. In order to go to our Python programs directory, we just type here cd Python programs, and we are now in our Python programs directory, and if you just type your ls here, you will see there is nothing in this directory. 
since it is a new one and we don't have any file created at the moment. What we want to do is we actually want to create our first program which will be a simple hello world program from Python and then in the next videos and in the next section we will continue or basically we will start with our first hacking uh, programs which will be the port scanners or basically scanning the target. So in order to actually create the program you just type here nano and then just specify the name of the program you want to create. In my case I just want to call it test and it needs to have the extension .py since PY stands for Python programs and it must really have that extension in order for Cal Linux to be able to run it from the terminal. So nano that and something you need to know uh, while actually creating any program in Linux is that you need to specify the path to the Python libraries which is the uh, which you can do with hash and then exclamation mark and then uh, slash user slash pin and then slash Python. This is something that you will specify at the beginning of every program that you actually code in Kali Linux. So make sure to remember this. I'll also, don't worry, I will also tell you this like every time that we actually code something that you need to specify this path right here. And in order for us to actually print hello world, we can actually just do print, open brackets, close brackets, and between the double quotes, which is specified in the brackets, we can just type hello world. This is the entire program. Print function basically prints anything or basically prints what is inside the brackets to our terminal and we specify that it should print hello world. You specify a string to be printed out by uh, putting it between the double quotes or single quotes. So let me just show you both single quotes and double quotes will work. You know it is a string but when it actually turns green right here so it changes color. Now this is not a must, if you for example change color from your terminal it might be some different color, but it doesn't matter. You will notice when it is a string and when it is not. I will just use double quotes in this case. And in order to save this file or to save this program you just type here control O. Then enter, as it says file name to write, you want to type here enter so it writes under that name and control X to exit. In order for you to for example clear the screen you can just type here clear which will just clear the, clear the terminal from previous commands. And let's see if we type here ls once again. We now have our test.py. Now, for those of you who are really new to this, I, let me just explain what nano did. So nano, as we used it once we actually wrote our program, is basically opening our program and actually it opens something similar to the, for example, notepad in the Windows where you can actually write anything, whether it is text or part of code, and then save it to a file. As we did right here, we saved this part of code to the file test.py. So let's close this. And right now, if we just try to run this, which we can do with either typing Python and then test.py, if we want to run it with Python 2, or typing Python 3 test.py. Now, before we can actually run this we need to make this an executable since if I just press here enter whoops it actually doesn't need to be made an executable since I specified the Python 3 but if I wanted to run it as an every other program with dot slash and then the name of the file which is test.py it will say permission denied since that program isn't really an executable. So in order for us to actually make it an executable we can just do chmod which stands for change mod and then plus x. This plus x stands for actually making a file an executable which you will need to do for every file you actually code and then you specify the name of the file itself which in our case it is test.py. So this command right here will make our file executable and if I just type here enter and press ls once again you can see right now we have the executable test.py and this command mine uh, and this command dot slash and then test.py should now work. As we can see right here, we are able to run the program, which just prints up hello world. So I just wanted to show you this, how you can actually create a simple program which just prints hello world. Some of the commands this we will use, which is such, such as chmod plus x, such as nano, which we will use to open the file in, for example, something similar to a notepad, ls to list files, then dot slash and then the name of the file to run the file itself, 
and I also showed you the Python 2 and Python 3 interpreters. So that would be about it for this video. This is just a uh, simple video where I explained why do we need to use Python and what we will be doing. So in the next section uh, we will actually start coding our scanning tools that we will use for scanning the target. So hope you enjoyed this video and I hope I see you in the next lecture. Bye! Hello everybody and welcome to the next section in our Python ethical hacking course. Now in the previous section what we did is we managed to code our command and control center which can actually take multiple connections and navigate through those sessions as we please. But right now what we will focus on is a little bit of network attacks and website attacks such as stealing Wi-Fi passwords such as for example uh, brute forcing any website with a login page uh, such as brute forcing Gmail, uh, basically discovering hidden directories, subdomains, spidering certain websites and so on and so on. Since most of those actually belong to the website penetration testing session, uh, we'll start off with a simple Wi-Fi password steal that you can upload to any actual Windows PC and get any passwords from that certain Windows PC for any Wi-Fi that they connected to. Now how we can do that is basically if you open up your command prompt, there is a certain actual uh, command that you can run for, in, for discovering the actual Wi-Fi passwords saved on that specific target. So if you just type here netsh vlan show profile, if you have a wireless adapter, what this will do is it will print out all the profiles or all the Wi-Fi hotspots that you connected to previously. As you can see, since this is my home uh, PC, I really only have one of those. Now these two are not even real actual Wi-Fi hotspots. This is just, these are just some of the uh, evil twin hotspots I created before, doesn't even matter. The real one is this one and this is my home wireless network. In order to actually get the key from that or key or password or however you want to call it from that specific Wi-Fi network, you need to type the command netsh vlan show profile, then space and you need to specify the network name of that specific actual uh, wireless network. So this in my case, you can specify any you want in your target machine or in your personal home machine as I do right now. But if you don't, don't have a wireless on your main PC, this will not work. Of course, this command will not actually get any output. You need to have a wireless adapter in order for this to work. So the next thing would be key equals clear. What this does is basically this command says that we want to get the password printed out in clear. And as you can see, let me just clear and run it once again so you can see it a little bit better. And as you can see here, the information for the wireless hotspot that I chose. This is its name. And if you go down here, you can find the security settings such as authentication, which is VPAW, or pardon me, WPA to personal, cipher is TKIP, present is a security key, which basically means that we have a security key or a password. And the key content is the actual password itself, which is for my wireless, this one. So that is how you can find an actual wireless password if you have access to someone's computer. But let's see how we can automate this process with an actual uh, Python program. So let us close this. What we need, what we will need for this actual program is two things. Well, first of all, I got the first one, which is the actual uh, regex pattern for discovering only the key or getting only the key from this output of the entire command. And the next one, you will need an email address where you can send the output to. Now you don't have to send it to an email, you can just write it to a file, save it on some PC, or you can even implement this in your actual uh, backdoor that we coded. So for example, if someone in our backdoor as a user runs get wireless key, then you specify, then you write a simple function that will give back the actual key in clear and send back to us. But for now on, all we want to do is just code a simple program that will send it to an email. So right here we go to the Python programs. We can just make email in this non-specific directory. So Wi-Fi still.py. 
we start off with our like regular line which is user being python and there are three things we want to import one of them is our normal sub process library which we will use in order to execute the actual commands in our command prop terminal the next one is smtp lib and we also need re which is basically regex which allows us to specify a pattern for the output of the command which will only strip out the password itself so basically what we want is the actual name of the of the actual wireless and then the password for that wireless. So we can do that simply with using these three libraries. Now you don't need to import it like this. You can import it one beneath another, but it doesn't even matter. So what we want to do right now is actually specify the actual command. So you can just type here command equals and then the same command that is specified in our command prompt. Now that command goes net sh vlan show profile. This is the actual beginning of the command that we want to send. Uh, and also the first command that we want to send. Now we will be sending these two times. First of all, or the first time we will only send this part right here, which will give us an output of all the available uh, wireless hotspots that were previously connected to with our wireless adapter. And then from that output of that command, what we will do is we will strip out uh, all the actual networks and profiles and send it back to our actual uh, email. So in order to do that, if you just check out right here, if you open up command prompt once again and type this command, you will see what the output is. So net, net sh vlan show profile. Oops, profile. Net sh. For some reason, it won't find any VLAN profile. Let me just see if I specified everything correctly. Okay, so I will just plug in and unplug my wireless adapter. And right now, if we just run it once again, Oh, it says the following command was not found. Okay, so I actually mistyped something or didn't mistype, I just forgot net sh vlan show profile. Okay, so here it is. Not really sure what the difference between this and this is, but okay, so I was missing an eye. Doesn't even matter. What we want to get is this part right here. So we want to get the actual name of the actual uh, fields right here. So we can use it in a second command that we specify net sh land show profile and then the name and then key equals clear. So in order to be able to execute this command, we need to get the name of these networks. And for each of those names, we want to get the password. So we need to strip out the names and we will do that with regex. But right be after we actually get the networks with the output of this command. So what we will do, we will use subprocess library, so subprocess dot check underscore output. We will run the command and shell equals true. And what this networks variable right here will have is it will have the output of this command, which is just all those profiles with the name of the actual wireless hotspots. And now we want to name uh, to create an actual list, which will contain all of those names. So networks network underscore list equals uh, basically you need to use the regex library right now I believe we used it before in order to create some pattern for something before I can't really remember what lecture that was but we want to use a simple function find all which will find everything in a specific variable which we will separate by comma so just type here networks is our variable and it will find it by specifying this pattern between the single or double quotes. And this is the pattern that we need. So question mark, two dots, profile, uh, then backslash, and then S star, and then basically two dots, backslash, uh, pardon me, where is my backslash? Okay, so here it is. And then S, close the actual, uh, the bracket, right bracket, and here I forgot to open the actual uh, let bracket so just like this and then afterwards we need to open bracket once again type dot then this star sign and then close the bracket now 
If you want to, you can actually just go, not really sure what the website is called, but you can go and just type Python regex and there is a website that you can just simply paste the output of your command and experiment with the actual regex until you get the output that you desire. So you can do that, just let's type Python regex Let's wait for this to actually load. And I believe it will be some of the first websites. We will see in just a second. Regular expression operation. How to, let's go with the first one. Import all, okay, but this is just the actual. Let us go and find where we can actually test it. Wait, here it is, Python regular expression editor. So, okay, so a, fig, a quick way to test your regular expressions. So, right here, or pardon me, right here, you will specify the output of the actual command. So let's actually find this on my Windows 10 machine, Python regex. We go and find it wherever it is. Well, let me just check out what the actual name of this website is, so pytex.org. So let's just go pytex. Hopefully it will find it, here it is. And right here we can paste the output of this actual command. So let's copy it, control C, paste it right here. And right now, if you just go right here, let me just close this, we don't need it and you run this string right here. Let me just lower this so you can see everything. Okay, just like this. And in the regular expression, you type the specified string that we specified right here. Then we want to get the two dots profile. Let me just switch this to English keyboard so I can actually get everything as before. Percent, uh, backslash S, then star sign then the uh, two dots, then backslash s once again, then closed parentheses, open parentheses once again, dot and then star and then close parentheses once again. And here you can see what the actual output or matches are, which are just the names of the actual profiles. And you can see that this will be our list containing these three elements right here and we will send the output for those three T elements or for those three elements to the actual uh, email that we specify. So let us go back to our Python. We specify the regex pattern correctly. And all we have to do right now is iterate. So we will just type here output equals and then the empty string. And for the actual for uh, network, in a network list, underscore list. So for each network or for each files hotspot in this list, what we want to do is first of all, uh, run the command to be equal to net sh, not capital N, so net sh plan, show profile, uh, then space, make sure to add space right here. So we want to concat this network right now, and then plus, and then uh, open double quotes, space key equals, clear. And this is the command that we want to execute next. So we will just do the, the one network result will be equal to sub process dot check underscore output. And let me just go open and close this. And we want to check the output of the command right here. Or if it is easier for you, let's call this command two. And let's call this command one. And here we want to check the output of the command one. And here we're checking the output of the command two, comma, and then the actual uh, shell equals true as we usually specify right here. And then we want to concat that to the actual final output. So let's call this final output so you can understand everything better. Final underscore output plus equals one underscore network underscore result. 
okay and all we have to do right now is either you can choose to write this to a file if you want to save it on the target pc for some reason or you can uh, or you can actually send this to an email so in order to send it to an email it is rather simple there are just a few lines that we need to code we need to create first of all server so server will be smtplib.smtp we will use google email services so smtp dot gmail.com pardon me gmail or and then at the port we want to select the port 587 we want to start the tls encryption so server dot oops server dot start tls open and close brackets as this is an actual uh an actual uh, function from the smtp library and then you want to log in to your email so server dot login in the brackets here you will specify the email and here you will specify the password so basically once you specify the email and the password which i will do later on so i don't actually show the email and the actual password uh, then you want to send this email to yourself so server dot send mail is the function and then in these brackets right here you need to specify the actual email the email from who are you sending the email to who are you sending and also the message itself so in our case we are sending the final output then we are sending from my own email to my own email so i will just specify here my email to my underscore email as well as here now this is not something that you need to type right here these are variables that we can actually paste to this function which i will do later on and then uh, basically the next thing or the third thing is the message itself which is final underscore output in my case okay so basically uh, afterwards all you have to do is quit the server and you will finish successfully this program so let's save it or if you want to add it and test it right here after you compile it you can just set the my email variable to be equal to raw underscore input and then you can just input the email itself so enter email to send to which is really no point to do that because this is something that you will run on target pc you don't want to prompt the target anything but for the test purposes you can just leave this and then this my email will be replaced in these functions right here and then it will send the actual uh, email you also need the password since we specified right here the password so this would be a password to the email that you are sending to so run underscore input enter email to send to and then you would save this compile it enter the email and then you will receive the email so i'll test this in just a second but first of all i will delete these two lines as we don't need it i will replace the my email and this my email or all three my emails with the actual real email and the password with the actual real password and then i will get to record once again in order to show you how it works okay so right now all we have to do is actually compile this but before we compile we need to make sure that the uh, actual smtp lib library and re library are installed in vine in Pi installer now i'm not really sure if they are default libraries most likely they are but let us just check just in case so root dot wine or drive c python 27 python dot exe minus m pip install smtp lib let's see if we have this installed or do we need to install it we will also check for the regex library but i believe regex comes pre-installed uh, for sure but we will check it just in case so we don't compile it twice and then we will compile the wi-fi still and run it on our windows 10 machine what we should get to our on our email is the actual uh, password for the uh, wireless hotspot that i have right here at home so smtp lib is installed re is probably installed as well and then we can compile the actual program okay so it is already satisfied let us compile the wi-fi still.py so wine 
root wine drive c python 27 scripts then uh, python py installer pardon me one file oops one file no console and wi-fi steel.py let's let this compile while we plug in our usb drive okay our usb drive is plugged in let's wait for this to finish it has finished go to the disk directory move wi-fi steel.exe to media root caddy live then we can unplug our usb drive go on our windows 10 machine we can paste it on our actual desktop and we can run this file and for some reason this has failed to execute let us see why oops well the reason why this doesn't work is probably something because of my windows 10 let's try to run it once again okay if we go right here we didn't really receive anything it's a little bit weird but okay it doesn't even matter we can try to run it i wonder what happens if we actually try to run it in the cal linux even though we don't really have an actual uh an SSH run show profile return non zero exit status. So that is good because if you just type your net SSH when show profile, it will say command not found because it is only on Windows. So that's why it doesn't work on Linux. But let me just check something out. Why it didn't work on our Windows machine is because of my adapter probably because it sometimes wants to connect and sometimes it doesn't want to connect. And the this command right here probably couldn't retrieve the actual uh, VLAN show profile which will show the entire profiles of the actual uh, wireless itself. So what we will try in the next video. Now I'm pretty sure that this will work on any other PC probably. If it doesn't we will in the next video code the uh, different version anyway which will just save this to a file. Then you can, as I said before, implement this to an actual backdoor and read from that file and send the actual output to your server. So I hope I see you in the next video and take care. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome to the last tutorial of the Wi-Fi program. Now in the previous tutorial we saw that we actually get failed to execute error. Now that is something regarding my PC I believe, since I don't have any other target to actually scan for. Uh, Make sure that if you get the same fail to execute error, make sure that you post somewhere, either in the question section or anywhere, that you get the same error so we can actually get the, and fix this. Now, I couldn't seem to find any error right here. I believe everything is good for now on. Now, I just want to show you before we continue to the next programs, I just want to show you how actually you can write this to a file instead of sending it over the email. So. Simply, we just leave everything the same as before. Uh, we have our command one, which is the net sh when show profile. Everything is the same. We check the output of that command. Then we find all the network names in that output. Then we iterate over those network names and we run the network when show profile. Uh, then plus the name of the network key equals clear, which will give us the password in clear text. Once we do that, we just add that to the final output. And right now, all we want to do is actually open a file so we can call it file equals open then we can open and close brackets call the file anything you want in my case i will just call it wi-fi passwords.txt and we want to open it for the writing so we open the file and all we have to do is file.write final underscore output and we close the actual file at the end. And what this will do is if you, for example, have a, a Wi-Fi steel.txt on this desktop directory, it will create an actual file right here, which will then store all the passwords from those uh, from the target host machine, wireless adapter. So it might be suspicious if you just compile this and send to someone. It, uh, first of all, you will not be able to get the passwords back. So the best use of this program is to actually use it inside the backdoor that we created before. So that is something that you will have to figure out 
or yourself. Of course, if you have some problems, make sure to post it and I will help you out with that. All you have to do is basically just import these commands and when sometimes, when for example, the server sends a command get passwords, then you perform all of this, you save to a file, then you read from that file, then you send all of the data that you read from it, and then you delete the file so it doesn't leave any trace behind. So simple as that. Once again, if you have any problems, feel free to ask. And let us continue into the next lecture where we will code our next program. So hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial. And right now we're going to code a brute forcer for the email or Gmail should I say. What we will do is we will code a simple program which will import only one library which in our case it will be the SMTP library and we will try to specify the email and the password to brute force or pardon me the password list. Now you can also use the uh, email list if you want to but right now all we will do is just brute force over the password. So it will be rather simple. It is a different brute forcer than for example brute forcing any login page online. It is a little bit different, that's why we will code it first. And then in the next tutorials we will continue over the brute forcers for some typical, for example, Metasploit login pages, some online login pages of different websites, and so on and so on. I will show you in the next tutorials how you can actually adapt your brute forcer to any login page you want. But for now on, let us start with the Gmail brute forcer. So let's first of all make directory brute forcers. Go to that directory and nano gmail.py. Oops, gmail.py. We add the user share or other me user bin Python at the beginning of our code and let's import SMTP lib. Now, first of all, if you want to, we can even use this to be an actual Python 3. So let's import from colored or from term color import colored. Now let me just see if I go and run my Python 3 from term color, import colored works and import SMTP lib also works. So we should be good to go. Let us nano back our gmail.py and let us continue coding. First of all, what we will do is we'll create a simple SMTP server. So let's just call it uh, SMTP server, simple as that. We will do the same thing that we basically did for our actual uh, Wi-Fi stealer, which will basically just give it the Gmail servers and the port of 587. So smtp lib is the method we want to use. And there between the double quote specify smtp.gmail.com. And after it, you need to specify comma and over port 587. Once you do that, we want to just type here smtp server dot a dot EHLO, which is a method from the SMTP server uh, library, and we want to start the SMTP server uh, encryption, encryption, pardon me, over TLS. So SMTP server dot start TLS, also open and close bracket, and this is our setting up of our SMTP server. What we will use instead of these functions is also the login function, and we will try and accept with a rule that will give us back the SMTP authentication error from which we can actually uh, find out whether we logged in successfully or we didn't. But before we do that, let us actually specify the password list and the actual username list or username as an email. So we will have a variable called user, which we will use input for the actual user of this program to input the actual email. And we're using input and not raw underscore input because we're using Python 3 at the moment. Then in between the brackets, we can specify something like this or with a star. The plus sign will be once we actually find the password. So enter targets, targets, email address. Then we close the double quotes. We close the bracket. Oops, we already have the brackets closed. And now we want to actually specify the path to a file. So pass wd file equals input, we will prompt the user to actually paste the input path to the to that password file. So enter the path 
to the password file. There we will specify the path or just the name of the file itself in case it is in the same directory and all we want to do is open that file for reading. So passwd file equals open underscore file or we can actually just maybe you will confuse it if we name it the same. What we will do is we will do something like this. So we'll just name it file equals passwd file. Then we open it up for reading, of course. Close the double quotes, close the brackets. And now we want to type here for each password. So, oops, in this file, so in file, what we want to do is we will try to perform the SNTP server dot login function. It is an inbuilt function in the SNTP library, so all we have to do is just use it, and we will use it in the try and accept rule. So try, what we will try is SNTP server, or SNTP, pardon me, SNTP server, and then dot login, and in here we will specify the user and the actual password. Now make sure that if you have a, a password list, you need to perform the password equals oops, password equals password dot strip. And what we want to do is we want to strip this from the new line character, which will be backslash n, and then we enter the triangle of login. In case this does work, we will just print colored colored, and here plus, so plus password found, and then percent %s, since we are going to pay parse a string to this, from the password. And then comma, and we need to specify the color, which will be green in this case. We close one bracket, we close second bracket, and then we actually break out of this loop. The next thing we want to do is in the accept rule, we want to use accept SNTP lib dot SNTP authenticate authentication pardon me error then two dots in case we get this error all we want to do is just print wrong password since we didn't manage to actually connect to the target so just print right here colored with the minus in square brackets wrong password and then we can add the password just like this. So, uh, comma, once again, and then red, so we want to print this in red, and close two brackets. Now let us see, if we save this, how does this work? So python3 gmail.py SNTPlib has no art attribute SMPT, of course, because we actually mistyped the actual error. So SM, SMTP, or where was the actual error? Let me just check it out. Okay. SMTP, SMTP. Where did we use the SMPT? TPLib, SMTP. I can't seem to find where we actually used it. Okay, so here it is. SMPT, it should be SMTP. So first goes T, then P. Let's save this. Run it once again. Enter target's email address. Whoops, right before we actually run this, we forgot to actually create the password list. So let us nano password or pass list. Let's call it like that, .txt. Here we will have hello world, password 1234, password 43, doesn't even matter, 1234567 Then we can have, for example, the real password, which is test 1234 and then exclamation mark, which is the actual fake password that I put for this email for the actual uh, demonstration purposes. Then afterwards we can add another more. So for example, volcano, football, and doesn't even matter, so on and so on. Now, of course, you would use a real password list and not this one. And right now, let us run this. 
enter targets Windows uh, enter targets email address which is Windows 32 then the W and then this uh, at sign gmail.com enter the path to the password file now right here you would specify a full path to the password file if it is not in the same directory since it is for us we just specify the name of the file so passlist.txt we can see wrong password wrong password wrong password and it finds out the password and it prints it out it says password found test one two three four exclamation mark in actual green so our gmail brute forcer works really well we can brute force passwords to the email accounts with this even though you shouldn't do it without any permission i need to repeat it once again and what we will do in the next videos is we will code some of some of the brute forcers for the actual login pages online. So hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye! Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial and what we did in the previous tutorial is we saw an example of a program that can brute force a Gmail. Right now what we want to do is create a simple program that will be able to brute force any website we want. What we will do is we will code a program that will take the actual data that we will deliver to the uh, page itself in a dictionary. Now that data will be something that you will need to change through every website that you try to brute force. But those are only just one line changes so nothing really to worry about. We will do the same approach as before. So if we see a uh, string that will actually indicate that we uh, failed to log in to our page we will pass to the next password and if we don't get that string what we will do is we will print the username and password and we will print found username and found password. Now in order to test this since you can't really brute force with a lot of passwords uh, our real websites we need our own website or our own login page that we can test this on. So what you want to do is start up your Metasploitable. So here is mine I will just start it up right here and what Metasploitable has is it comes with the damn vulnerable web application where it actually asks you to log in before you can use it. What we will try to do is we will try to simply just brute force that login application. Since we already know the real credentials for that and since that is not a real website we can actually test our brute forcer on that. So open up your Metasploitable open up your terminal let us navigate through our directory let me just enlarge this one time so here it is cd python programs and we want to go to the brute forces currently so we have our gmail.py we have our passlist.txt right now what we want to do is nano brute force brute forcer however you want to call it .py Okay, so right here, let us type uh, hash and exclamation mark and then user slash bin slash python. And we'll just stop right here in order to log into our Metasploitable right here. So MSF admin and MSF admin is the username and password as before. And what you want to do is first of all, check the actual IP address of your Metasploitable and navigate to, the, that, to that IP address on your Firefox or Google Chrome. So right here I have Metasploitable 192.168.1.5 and you should see this page once you open it up. You will have these five links and the link that you want to click on is the DVWA. It will lead you to this page as you can see username and password and there we have the default hint or basically we have a hint down here which says default username is admin with password password. Now of course let's pretend that we don't really see this now let us try to log in with some random credentials. So 123, 123, 123, 123. And we can see that we didn't manage to log in with our fake credentials, but we did get a string which says login failed. So this is a key string that we will search in our HTTP response from the Metasploitable in order to check out whether we managed to guess the username and the password. So let us go right here. We started our actual uh, program, but before we actually continue with it, let us create a simple actual password list, which we will use, which needs to have our own list, right? Which needs to have our own password. As you can see, the password, the 
correct password for this website is the password and the username is admin. So let us nano password list.py. Hello, one, two, three, four, password. Or let's not put password that soon. Let us use admin root tor uh, password one, two, three, one, two, three password. And then we will use this password right here, which is the correct password. Now, of course, once again, if you don't want to use this password list right here, you can just navigate to, I believe it is home. Or let me just locate word lists, locate word lists. Let me see where the actual, okay. So the directory to the word lists is user share. So CD user share word lists. If you just type here LS, you will have multiple word lists. One of most of them are for different programs such as DNS map.txt, Deerbuster, DeerB, Metasploit. In the Metasploit directory, you can of course find some of the useful Metasploit framework uh, password lists for different types of the attacks. And the most known actual password list will be this rocku.txt password list. It contains around 14 million passwords and it is mostly used to hack uh, websites like this. Now this is of course once again, not a real website, so it really doesn't matter which password list we use, but in a real life attack, you would want to use a password list similar to this, since this password list was created from gathering passwords from hacked accounts. So let us go back to our root Python programs, root forcers, and first of all, let me just nano my pass, password.py, okay. Wait, why did I call it password.py? It should be .txt, so txt. Yes, save under different name. And what is the name of our program? Okay, so it is brute forcer. Let us start up our program one more time. And right now, we need to import two libraries in order to perform this. Now, first library would be the requests library, which we will need in order to actually uh, send and receive the actual re HTTP response and HTTP request. Now, before we do this, let us actually imagine and see what we need to do in order to be able to code this. So let's navigate to the page that we want to brute force. And this step is the same for actual every uh, page that you encounter, whether it is a page on Metasploit framework or pardon me on Metasploitable, or any real life page that has this similar login, username and password. So let us refresh so we get the real page right here. And all you want to do in order to actually be able to understand what we're going to do is go to the open page source. It will open up the HTML code right here. And what you're searching for is the form. Now the form is something that we fill in right here, such as the username and password. And in the form, there should be three variables, at least one of them will be username, one of them will be password. And the third one will be this button that we have to click in order to actually log in to that page. Now we will have to click this button through our code. Uh, and we will also have to specify this button right here in order to be able to perform the entire action. Since if we only, since if we only fill these two fields and we don't do anything with this button, nothing will work. So in order to do that, it is most likely going to be in the body. So just go on these arrows and press them down. You can see right here, form action login.php method post. Now, since this is the only post method right here, we can for sure say that it is actually corresponding to this actual username and password. So click arrow on this right here and on the field sets. There, you should have some similar field sets as to the name of the actual fields in the web page itself. As you can see, label for username, it even selects it right here. So we are going through this part right here. And what we are interested in is the name of the username. So we can see the type is text, the class login input size 20, but the name is something that we are interested in and something that we are going to specify in our code. Same with the password, as you can see right here, we have the password field, the label for the pass is password, and we are interested once again in the name. So we can see the name is actually password. 
Now, in the actual uh, button, in order to find it, here it is, P class submit. Now, we are interested in the class and in the name itself. We can see that the button is, once we click it, its name is login. And it also specifies right here that the name of the button is login. The type is some submit and the value is also login. So those are all the things that we will have to specify in our code in order to be able to actually log in to this page. So let us do that right now. Import requests. The next thing we want to do is specify the URL that we are actually going to brute force. So the URL would be the actual URL of this page right here. So you can copy it if you are running this from the actual Kali Linux Firefox or you can just type it like me. I will just lower this and type the URL. We will store it in, for example, a variable called page underscore URL equals and then between the double quotes we need to specify the full URL. So in order to specify the full, your full URL you need to specify first HTTP. Since this is an HTTP page as we can see it is not safe. It is not HTTPS. We need to press the two dots double slash forward and then the IP address which in my case is 192.168.1.5. Now, if this was a real page, you would not specify the IP address, you would specify the actual name of the page itself. Then afterwards, we need to type slash right here and navigate to the DW, uh, DVWA directory and then slash once again. And the file that we want to actually interact with is login.php. The next thing you want to do is prompt the user of this program for the actual username and then we will iterate our passwords in order to be able to guess it. So username equals raw underscore input and let us prompt the user. First of all, let me enlarge this and let us prompt the user for the actual username. So enter username for specified page. And right here we can close the double quotes, close the actual bracket. And what we will do is in the next video, or not in the next video, right now what we are going to do is open the file for reading and in the next video we are going to code a function that will actually crack the password itself. So for now on we only specify the URL and the username. Right now what we want to do is we want to open this file that we made. So password list dot txt I believe let us remove the password list dot py we don't need it that was a mistake and let us navigate to our program and open it so with open password list dot txt and then we want to open it for reading of course we want to open it as password since this is our list of the passwords we want to actually crack for each password we want to try it with our username. So brute forcing, we can call our function like that or just brute force and we will parse two arguments to this function which one of them will be username and the other one will be URL. So these are two things that we are passing, pardon me, page underscore URL. So make sure to specify the same name and then we want to actually print if this doesn't work, print or we'll actually print that in the next video for now and let us just leave it like this and we are going to code this function in the next video. Now don't worry it is not that long so we will be able to finish it pretty soon. Hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye! Hello everybody and welcome back to our brute forcer and in the previous video all we did was specify the page URL which needs to be correct in order for this to work and we also prompted the user for the actual username. We also implemented a brute force function or we didn't implement it, we only called it and right now we want to implement that function for our program. So let us go up here, we can implement it right here, def brute force, the actual uh, things that we parse is the username and the URL. So make sure to add the two dots and what we want to do right now is only iterate over these passwords in our list. So for password, in the passwords file that we opened, so for password in passwords, first of all, if you notice right here, 
we want to strip the password of anything that might present us a problem. So right here, for example, this new line, then slash error, and anything basically that could present the problem. So we'll just use the function strip on our passwords in order to do that. Basically, we did it a bunch of times, so nothing really there to explain. We will just redo the password variable to be equal to password dot strip. So next thing we want to do is we can just print right here the passwords that we are currently trying. So right now we can just print right here trying to brute force with password and then we want to add the password itself. So we will just add space and then plus and we will concat the string of the password itself. Now the next thing is the most important thing for this program is to actually create a dictionary. So we can just call it data underscore dictionary. So you can call it anything you want. And dictionary is basically uh, referred to with these curvy brackets right here. So it is not the same for the list or it is not the same for the normal brackets. This is how we can create a dictionary. Now what dictionary will take is the key and the value. And I will just show you once again, as we show in, as we saw in the previous video, we are interested in these usernames and passwords or basically name fields for our input fields on the page itself. We are also interested in the name for the actual submit button, which is this login button right here. So we need to parse all of that to our actual uh, brute forcer or our actual dictionary. So let us do that right here. I'll just lower it so we can see both of these screens. We can see the HTML code and we can also see the Kali Linux. So right here, first of all, let us parse the actual username since that is what comes first. We know that the name of the name field of the username field is just same username. So just specify right here username. And in order to divide the key and the value, you need to specify two dots right here and parse the actual next value. So username is the actual field with the name username. Simple as that. Now, let me just explain what this actually does right here. It will search for the field under the name username which is this field right here, and it will paste to that field this variable username that we created at the beginning of our program right here. We also parsed it to our function, so it will just switch it right here. The same we need to do for the password as well. As we can see, the name for the password field is just password, so make sure to first of all separate by comma, then in between double quotes, once again password, and then two dots, and the actual variable that we are parsing, which is the password variable. And the last thing we need to specify is the actual button itself. Now, the actual thing that we are doing, interested in is the class and the name of the button itself. The name is the first thing that we specify right here, which is login under the double quotes, then two dots. And we can see that the button is type submit and class submit. So we want to specify also between the double quotes submit. Since this is not an actual variable that we specified in our program, we need to pass, parse both of these values in the actual double quotes. So once you do that, basically most of our job is already done. All we need to do is forward this dictionary to the actual page itself. In order to do that, we need to perform a post request, which the requests library will help us do. So go next line. And what we want to do is create a response. And the response will equal this response variable. We catch the actual uh, requests dot post. And this post actual function right here will for our case take two inputs or two arguments to this function. One of them will be the URL where we are posting, which in our case is the just URL or the page URL, however you want to call it right here. So to this URL, we want to paste data and the data is equal to the our dictionary. So data underscore dictionary. Now it is simple to understand. Basically we are uh, trying to connect to this page and parsing this data where it needs to parse it. It is simple as that. The Python basically does uh, or does most of the things for us. All we have to do is specify these two lines and these two lines are something 
that will change for every page you actually brute force. Well, not really these two, actually only this line is something that you want to change if you want to brute force a different page, everything else can be the same. Of course you can also, you need to also change the link itself, but that is common sense. So what we want to do right now is check for the actual response once the username and password is incorrect. So you can see once we tried in the previous video we get this login failed uh, string printed to the screen. Now we will use that string in order to be able to actually uh, realize once we got the password right and once we got the password wrong. So in order to do that we can just type here if and then the string of login failed. Now make sure to specify the same letters otherwise this will not work so it has to be the same. The best thing to do is to copy and paste it and then if login failed is in the response variable dot content content now this actual response variable will take an actual element of the content and it will check whether this string right here is in this content of our response. We sent a post request and we are checking back the response. If it is there, all we want to do is pass to the next password. If it isn't there, that means that we actually got the password correct and that we managed to log in. So we want to proceed to print. Oops print right here with the plus username and we can do something like this plus the actual username variable that is currently in this part of iteration and we also want to do with the password itself password plus password variable and we can just exit the program once we get the username and the password there is no really need to continue brute forcing. So let us try out our program, hopefully it will work right now. And if we chmod it in order to be able to run it, and we run our brute forcer, enter username for specified page. Now we can actually try with a wrong username first of all since let us specify root to be and we can see right here trying to brute force with password hello trying to brute force with this nothing really worked since we used the wrong username but let us use a real username which will be the username admin and we can see once it reaches the password in our list it prints out username admin password admin and it also quits the program now let me just check why do we get one last time trying to brute force with password. So let us fix that. Nano brute forcer.py. Okay, I think I know what the problem is. In our password list.txt, we actually have an empty uh, line, I believe. So let us try it once again with a wrong passwords. Now this is not really something important. It is rather just for it to look better. As we can see, we managed to get rid of it. And also what we want to add to our brute forcer is in case it doesn't really find the actual password in this list, we just want to print at the end of this program. Let us open square brackets, two exclamation marks. Uh, password isn't is not in this list. And we can just print that. Let us see how that will work. Root. And we can see everything works perfectly. Once we specify the actual list and the wrong username, we don't get the password. And once we specify the actual real username, we get password as the correct password for that website. So hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial and right now what we are going to do is we are going to code a program that will be able to discover some directories on the target web page. So for example once again we are going to test this on our Metasploitable. We will need a file which is going to contain some directories that are possible to be found on some web page. So we can use any file in our actual uh, Kali Linux, since this is actually just a test, we don't really need a real file. So let us see in word lists whether there is anything similar to that. So if we go to their buster, or their, but let me just check right here, cat common 
.txt and we can use some of these actual lists in order to be able to discover some additional directories on our target PC. So first of all what I want to do is copy this command.txt so copy it to our python pro or pardon me root slash python programs slash uh, brute forcer. Even though this is not really a brute forcer, we will just put it in that directory, doesn't even matter. We are basically brute forcing directories. It is something similar. So let us go to that directory. Go to brute forcers. And let us nano our directories.py. This program, as I said, will go discover additional directories on target PC. Or pardon me, not on target PC, on target website. And how we'll do that? Well, first of all, we'll open the file with our command or our command.txt file with our directories, possible directories. Then we will add a slash to our link to the web page. And then we will add those additional directories after the slash itself. Then we will perform a get request and we will see whether we get an error while performing get request or if we don't. If we do get an error, that means that web page doesn't really exist. And if we don't get an error, that means that web page exists. So let us start off with the user bin python, our usual line. And of course, we will need to import requests library. So right now, first of all, the most common thing to do right now is first to actually prompt the users for the target URL. So we can just use something like this, target underscore URL equals raw underscore input. And in between the double quotes, we will specify, let's do something like this, enter target URL. So we can do something like that. And afterwards, we need to open our file containing the directories. So file equals, let's call it, no, let's just call it file equals open. And let me just, I believe it was common.txt. If it is not, we will just check it out later on and we'll switch it if it isn't that name. We want to open it for the actual reading, but not in that double quotes. We want to open different double quotes and then read. And right now we want to go for each line in this list. As usual, we want to perform the get request. So for line in this word list or we call it file doesn't even matter so for line in file which is our command.txt we first of all want to add the word so word will equal line.strip now you could have also just left here line equals line.strip but it doesn't really matter let us just use word since it is more prettier than actual line and all we want to do is add to our URL this word. And how we can do that is we can do something like this. Full underscore URL will be equal to the target URL, which is the URL that our user of this actual program will specify. We need to add the string of the slash. Since if you go to any web page right here, you will see that the different directories have slashes. So we also want to add one in order to specify the directory. And we need to add the actual word right after it. Then what we will do is we will actually create a response. So response variable will equal and we will make an actual function, which will be a request function to the uh, specified URL. So to the target underscore URL or pardon me, we specify the full URL. So we are no longer parsing the actual uh, parsing the actual target URL, we need to specify the full URL right now. And this function is something that we will code in the next video. So hope you enjoyed this short tutorial and we will continue with this directories.py in the next tutorial. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial and let us finish up our directories.py program. So what we did for now on is we asked the target to specify or the user to specify the URL. We opened our command.txt file containing additional directories. And for now on, we only perform the, per, the creation of the full URL to test on. Right now we need to code this test function or request function, pardon me. 
So we can just put it right here, request, it will take an input of the URL. And what this request function will do is it will basically try to connect to that specific URL. So it will try to actually request dot get. So we will perform a get request onto this URL specified in the actual function itself. But before we parse the URL, we need to also add the HTTP. So I'll just show you right here, just specify it like this, HTTP, two dots, slash, slash, and then close double quotes, and then plus the URL. Now the reason behind this is basically, for example, if user just copies this part right here, which doesn't contain HTTP, it will not, it will not be able to actually connect to that web server. So what we need to do is either the user of this program needs to specify in the raw input function the full URL with the HTTP two dots and two slashes. And, or if they specify just this link right here, we need to add the HTTP ourselves to that code. So we will try this and we will accept if this, if we get the error, so requests, and we will use the connection error. So if connection error appears, that means we weren't able to connect, which means that directory doesn't exist on the specified target. So exceptions dot connection error. And we will just pass in that case. We don't want to do anything else. And from this function, we actually want to return this because we actually specified that the variable right here equals to this function from the specified URL. So we want to return the result or the response to the actual response function. And if this response function has something, so if response, then we want to print this cover directory with the actual world, uh, with the actual word that we specified right here. Now, why are we typing right here if response? Well, basically, if this doesn't work, this part right here, it will go to the accept and it will pass, which means nothing will be returned from this function to the actual response. So response will be actually containing nothing. So if response has something, then we print this. That's why we specify it like this. So print uh, plus right here, and then discovered directory at this link and then we can close the double quotes and plus the actual full underscore URL, which will be the URL containing the specified URL and also the added word. So right now let us test out this program. This is basically the entire program. So save this, close it right here. Let us chmod it. So chmod directories.py and we want to run the directories.py enter target URL. So since we have specified in the program to already have the HTTP right now, all we want to add is 192.168.1.5 and then slash. And let's see what we can use. We can use basically, for example, this part right here, which is mutilde. I believe that is how you pronounce it. Not really sure. So mutilde. Is that how you even actually type it? Let us check out. Okay, so we are missing a Y, not a Y, an I. So let us go right here. And that should be the URL. So let us press enter right here. Discover directory this link. So we are discovering some additional directories. You can see classes, credits, documentation, footer, header, images, includes installation and bunch of others as well. So these are all the directories that actually exist. If you want to try out, we can just simply just use these images and let us go right here and just type images and let's see where it leads us. And you can see it leads us on a specific directory containing different images on the Metasploit framework or on the Metasploitable machine. So we can also check something out right here. We can see the robots.txt. So we can just go right there and check if that one exists, robots.txt, press enter, and you can see right here that the robots.txt file exists on our Metasploitable. So our program works well. We managed to code it to discover different directories. So let us just try on a different target before we actually quit. So let us go to, for example, uh, 
let's not go right here. We can go to dvwa. So let us try with that one. Directories.py 192.168.1.5 dvwa. Press here enter. And we can see we already discovered one directory and two more. So it works for that directory as well. Any website you actually specify right here will find other directories that might actually be interesting to you, such as, for example, these passwords right here. So we will check that out in just a second. We can see there is a passwords directory in our Metasploitable. And we can go right here in order to check it out. It is in the previous scan. So let us go right here and add passwords. Accounts.txt file is something that we found. And you can see we actually managed to find something interesting on our Metasploitable. You can have you have some Adrian, some password, and some different strings right here. Some different accounts also containing different usernames and different passwords. So that would be about it for our directories.py. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope I see you in the next tutorial where we will continue coding. Bye. Hello everybody, and welcome back to this section. And in the previous video, we saw how we can actually create a program and use it in order to discover some hidden directories that we might find interesting. We saw on our Metasploitable a directory called passwords.txt, where we actually managed to find some of the passwords. Now, of course, that directory is on purposely or purposely made in order for you to test programs like this and find it. On the real websites, it is not likely that you will that you will encounter something so significant to the at attacker as a password list, but you never know. Also, you might find some valuable information, such as some uh, versions of software running there, some additional files, some Tomcat files, PHP files, and basically anything that could be useful for your future attacks. Now, since we saw how we can actually create a uh, directory brute forcer or directory finder, however you want to call it, let us see what we need to do in order to be able to do the same with the subdomains. Now let us nano our brute forcer or let us copy our directories.py into subdomains.py. Now right here we should have both of these programs which will be the same. So let us right now, let me just close this. Oops. Let me nano subdomains.py. And right here we have our program which we coded in the previous video, which is basically the same as the actual uh, directories.py. So what we have to do right now is change just a few things in order to get this to be a simple subdomains finder. So actually there is only one thing that we need to change, I believe. It is this part right here. So you can see that when we search for a directory, we search for something like this. So we find a website, let's say it is uh, google.com, then we add a slash, and then we brute force any directory, admin, password, and so on. But right now, what we're going to do is we're going to use google.com, for example, and we're searching for a subdomain, which can be, for example, uh, a country, so for example, us.google.com or something like that. So what a subdomain is, is this prefix to the actual website right here. It helps us discover some different pages on the website that we might, uh, that we maybe weren't able to discover without this. So let us see what we need to do in order to change that. We will not change the request function right here as it is returning the URL that we parse to that function. So nothing really here sh we should actually change. We accept the connection error, which means that we cannot connect to the specified subdomain, which is good. We've prompt the target for the actual URL, which is also something that we won't change. The file to open on this is something that you can change if you want to. I will just leave it on the common.txt. Or you can actually do something like this. So uh, file underscore name. And you can just do something like this right here. So file underscore name equals raw underscore input. And you can prompt the actual user for the file that they want to use to brute force. So uh, enter file to use. And just close the brackets right here. And then we parse the actual file into this function right here. So let me just go down here. 
And let me see what else we need to change. Now this is something that you don't really need to import if you don't want to, but just in case let us make this program mostly user friendly so we can continue with the other stuff now. We will not change anything right here. The full URL is the most important thing we have to change. So first of all, the target URL should go after the actual uh, subdomain. So we will just add everything we need before the target URL. So what we're going to do is we're going to type here uh, word which is our line just stripped from everything that might encounter that might actually pre present a problem. So for example, if we had a line which is passwords in our actual file, and it had a new line character, we would get something like this, which really doesn't exist. Whoops, google.com. What we want to do is we want to actually navigate this to the same line. So that's why we strip everything from the unnecessary things. So right here, we use a word plus, then we will add a string. And in between these double quotes, we will just specify a dot, which will actually represent the subdomain itself. Then to this dot, we will add our target URL, and we'll perform the actual response or the request function and returning the actual response to the response variable. We check whether that response is none or if it is actually received. If it is received, we will print not discovered directory, we will print subdomain or discovered subdomain at this link and then we will print the full URL. So let us see how this will work. If we or first of all, let me just run our metasploitable. So we can actually use it in order to test this on something. Now this is something that you can actually test on the other websites as well. It's nothing really uh, dangerous to do. You are just discovering different subdomains for that specified website. It's not like you're brute forcing a username and password. This is something that can help you actually enumerate and find out more different pages for that specific website. Now, of course, if you are running a brute force attack on the username and login credentials, you are not allowed to use this on any other website unless it's actually in basically normal terms, such as, for example, sending three or four passwords just to check whether your program exists, uh, whether your program works well. If you run this with a password list of 10,000 passwords, then that is something called uh, that is something that you can consider illegal. So you shouldn't really do that. Let us see whether our metasploitable opened. Okay, I have config the IP address 192.168.1.5. Let me just find my actual arrow from the mouse. Okay, so had a little bit of problem finding my mouse there. Let me just do this once again and tap this down. Okay, so let us try to run our program subdomains.py, enter target URL 192. Yeah, we actually need to specify only the IP address since you remember we actually added the HTTP in the code itself. So 192.168.1.5 and then the file to use will be the same command.txt doesn't really matter. This is only just for us to actually test the program itself. Now, if it discovers any subdomain, that is good. If it doesn't discover, doesn't really matter. What matters is that our program works. We don't get any error. We actually try to perform the request on these certain pages. It's just that currently we cannot really seem to find any on the actual 192.168.1.5, which is our metasploitable. It could be also that we are using a wrong password list or not password the subdomains list. Now, what you want to do when you're running these types of attacks or enumeration attacks, if however you want to call it, you want to find the actual directory you want to find an actual list that contains something that could possibly be a subdomain or a directory. There is not really a point in running this attack with a password list such as the rocky.txt, which is mainly focused on the actual account passwords. You want to actually have a real password list for these types of attacks. So for example, there is a subdomain news, uh, org, something like that. You want to have all of those in your list once you run this. 
So let me just check out. This is not really finding anything. So let us just quit it right now. Okay. Let me get the passlist.txt. Yeah, okay, this is nothing really interesting for us. Let me go to user share wordless. Perhaps we can actually find something right here that could be rather useful to us. So let me go to Dear Buster. Okay, nothing really here for us, I believe. Yeah, nothing here for us. CD to derb ls. Let us see right here whether we have something interesting. Extensions command.txt. Let me see what that is. Okay, so these are just extensions for some of the files. Nothing really interesting as well. Let's cd to others. cd to wants. We're basically just trying to find something that could be a good uh, actual uh, list for this type of attack. So let us just locate subdomain and let's see if we find anything. Link some do subdomains.txt. Okay, so something in Metasploit framework. So user share Metasploit framework data word lists. And here we should have some subdomain word list. Let me just find where it is. We saw it in the locate function, so let's just grab ls, oops, ls, and then grab subdomain. And here is our list, so let us get the actual list just to see what it has. Well, okay, oh, it's a link subdomains.txt and nothing really useful for us there as well, so subdomain. Let me see whether there is something else instead of this actual uh, list that we have right here. Yeah, okay, so there really isn't. Maybe even there is, it's just not called like this. It doesn't even matter, basically. Uh, you can use any password list you want, whether it is uh, made for the subdomains or not. For now on, we will just skip to the next tutorial, not really there's no really point in actually continuing to find a password list. It, what matters is that our program works and you can use it for your own needs. So hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this section. And right now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how you can use requests library in order to change some of your headers in your actual HTTP request. So for example, we know that when we send the HTTP request, we actually send a few different things such as the actual IP address, the uh, user agent, the encoding, the data, everything you send within that request. And some of those things or different fields that you're sending with the HTTP request also send your information, such as for example, the user agent. Now the user agent sends the information about you your browser, your PC basically, and it sends it back to the server and then the server can actually see from where or not from where or basically from what you are sending your request. So for example, let me just show you if we open up our burp suit. I'm not really sure if we can see it there, but we can definitely try to do something like that to actually intercept our request and see what are the things that we actually send to the server once we perform an HTTP request. So right here, okay, I accept, doesn't even matter. Burp suit is basically an actual uh, program that comes in the Kali Linux and which, with which you can actually intercept the HTTP requests and HTTP replies. Now the burp suit actually has to have a certificate in your Firefox, so make sure to do that before actually trying to intercept the requests with this tool. Uh, there are a bunch of other tutorials on YouTube on how to do that, so that's not really something that we will cover. All you want to do after you configure it with your Firefox is turn the intercept off in order so you can actually uh, locate, uh, in order so you can actually load the pages themselves. Because if your intercept is on in this tool, that means it will just skip or not skip, it will just pause at every packet you try to send and receive and it will not load the page until you forward that packet manually. 
So right here, let us go, for example, to our 192.168.1.5, which is our metasploitable. Let me just go right here before we actually do any of that, since in preferences, I need to set our burp suit. Okay, never mind. In this tool, it is not set. We will just not use burp suit at this moment. So what we want to do right now is actually open up our Python interpreter. Uh, there really isn't a point to use a program at the moment. And first of all, we want to import the requests library, which will allow us to send the actual requests themselves, just in, as in the previous videos. And the first thing you want to do is actually navigate to this website right here. Let me just go right here, open up my Firefox. And there, there is a website called uh, httpbin.org slash headers. Not really sure if it still exists, but we can try to do it. So, httpbin.org slash headers. And this website, what this website will basically do is it will show you how your request looks like. So you can see right here, you can either check the headers themselves like this, the request and the response header, the raw data, and you can also check it in the JSON format if you like. Now you can see the request header has some different fields, as I said, such as encoding, host, user agent, and this user agent field basically sends the information about us. As you can see, Mozilla Firefox, Linux x86. This is all information about our Kali Linux machine that is uh, going to the server with our request headers. If you want to, for example, change just this field and send to the server as if you're connecting from some different device or something, anything you basically want to specify, you can do that with the Python library. So let us go right here. First of all, close this, import requests. And what you want to do is use a variable or not a variable. In this case, it will be a dictionary because we want to specify dictionary the same as in our brute forcer. We want to call the dictionary my headers. So this will be our header fields, which will contain the key and the value of different fields. So first of all, we will specify the field between the quotes. So the field name is user dash agent. So that is the field, field name that we actually want to change. And the reason why we're changing this is because this is the only actual field that sends our information. Now in order to specify or to separate the key from the value, we just type here two dots. And then again, between the quotes, we specify the actual value we want to add to this uh, field right here. So the value that we want to add will be basically anything you want. So for example, let's pretend that we are iPhone 6. So just type here iPhone 6, press enter, and we created a dictionary that has a value of iPhone 6 in the field user agent. All we have to do right now is actually create a response. So we can call it r equals requests dot get. And then between the request dot get, first of all, we need to specify what web page we want to actually get the re response from. So we can just specify the HTTP and the, the two dots and then two slashes and then HTTP bin dot org slash headers. So if you just press here enter, this is just going to actually uh, get the page itself. And you can see right now, if we just print, uh, for example, r.url, it will, it will print you the URL that we try to actually search. If you print r.txt or text, it will actually send the output of the page itself. So you can see right now that currently our actual header or request headers look like this. So we have the accept, accept coding, uh, host, and the user agent is set right now to be Python requests with this version, which means that the server will know that we actually perform these requests with Python program. Now, for example, you want to change that. You do not want to do that with the actual Python program. You want to make sure that the server doesn't know how we perform this request. So you can do that with R2 equals, this is our second request that we are actually going to send. So R2 equals requests dot get 
in between the actual single quotes, we can specify the same link. So HTTP, then two dots, slash, slash, HTTP bin dot org, slash headers. And afterwards, we're also in the brackets, now separate it with the comma and specify the headers that you want to send. So headers equal my headers, which is a dictionary that we created at the beginning or our program. Press here, enter. This will take time to actually send the request and get the response back. And if you print the r2.url, it will print the same URL as before. But right now, if you print r2.text, you can see that currently our headers are different. We actually have the user agent field specified as iPhone 6. This is our request that we performed. And now the server will actually receive this data right here. And there would be no other way for them to actually find out how we send this. Now, of course, uh, user agent iPhone 6 is never specified like this. They would know that someone has actually changed this because this is not something that you really see, especially if you can do something like this. So let us find my headers. You can just type here iPhone 12 and basically perform the actual same request right here. And if I print r2.txt, they would think that the actual request came from the iPhone 12, which didn't even come out yet. Now, maybe if in future, if you watch this, there is an iPhone 12, but currently there really isn't. So this is something that you can actually change to anything you want. For example, uh, let's set my headers variable. Let's also set a different field. So the field can be something like this. Let us see whether this will work. So comma, then we specify host, two dots, and for example, google.com. Let's see whether this right now will work. If we try to search for the same website, print r2.txt, and you can see that right now it appears as if the host is google.com, even though we search for this website right here, which can be a little bit strange, but that is something that Python library or Python request library allows us to do. Now you don't need to use this website, just this website is useful to practice this because it actually shows you your requests. If you, for example, wanted to load the uh, actual uh, Metasploitable website or Metasploitable web page, which is on our IP address of 192.168.1.5, you can do that with r3 equals requests.get, or let us just change this to r3 because we don't want to type everything once again, and we can just type print here r3.txt. And you can see right here, let me just check it out. Okay, yeah, we didn't really change the actual website that we are searching for. So delete this up to the two slashes and then 192.168.1.5. Press here enter, it will perform its get request. It will take just a few seconds. And after it finishes, we will just print the r3.txt to see what we get from there. Now, of course, in that actual field, you will not be getting these headers anymore. You will be getting the actual contents of the page. So r3.txt is actually the contents of the page itself that you use to load. Now, the reason why we are here getting printed the actual headers is because the actual contents of this page that we try to load are our headers. It is used to test this program or not this program, basically any program that actually interferes with the headers themselves. So for some reason, this is taking a little bit of time. Let us see why is that. Now we can actually just try to search for a different website. Or let us actually go to our Python program. So Python programs, brute forcers, nano, uh, iPhone6.py. So we can just call it anything we want. User bin Python. Let us just import requests real quick requests. Uh, and then what we want to do is create my headers. Once again, we will set that to be equal to our iPhone. So open and close these weird brackets, not really sure how to call them user dash agent agent two dots iPhone six. Okay, then we perform the actual get request. So requests dot get 
we want to get, for example, this web page right here. Doesn't even matter. You can just test this on any web page you want. Just make sure to add the HTTP and then uh, two dots and two slashes because otherwise it will not work and parse the actual headers that you changed into this request, uh, into this re get request. And then afterwards we can print the r.text. So let us close this ch mode the actual iPhone 6.py and let us run this. We run our iPhone 6.py and we can see we print different contents to our web page. Now this content is basically an HTML code of the page that you actually load once you search for that actual website. So this is the HTML code. You don't really print the requests anywhere, but you can see that we were able to connect even specifying that we are coming from the iPhone 6 and not from the Kali Linux machine over Firefox, or in this case over Python 2. Because if we actually perform the request from here, it would say that the user agent was Python 2. So you can see this actual page is huge. So let us just clear this. Now you can just change it to anything you really want. It doesn't have to be iPhone 2. You can just type here Windows 10, but you get the actual point. This is something that allows you to change your headers and therefore even be a little bit more anonymous if you want to while performing some different tasks. So that would be about it for this tutorial. Hope you enjoyed this little demonstration and I hope I see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back and let us start off by coding our base or digest authentication brute forcer. Now if you're coming from my actual uh, ethical hacking course, you already saw how we can actually brute force a base authentication. Now we will expand that program into digest authentication as well. Now digest authentication is not something that you encounter most of the time, but we can still use it in order to see how you can implement different types of actual authentication into your program. And also you can actually, even after this program is finished, add some other authentications as well. Basic is basically the as it says, it is the basic authentication. It is something that you actually encounter while, for example, uh, logging into my router. So let me just show you if you just go right here to Firefox and try to search the IP address of my router, it will basically uh, prompt you for the actual username and password. So let me just show you right here. It prompts this window, then I log in with username and password and these credentials will actually be delivered, delivered over the basic authentication. So let us see how we can actually brute force this. So let me just, as you can see, since I didn't type anything, it says protected object, server is protected. So never mind. let us go to our base, to our brute forces directory and nano base or digest auth.py. Start off with the usual line, user bin python, and I will import here everything that we will actually need for this actual program. So we can import requests right away since we know that we are going to use this as this is our main library in this section. We want to also import the threading library. So from threading import thread so we can actually use it with a little less letters in this syntax. We will also need this threading library because we all need the, to manage different threads that will actually brute force the actual basic authentication. So that's why we are using this library. We will use sys in order to specify the actual arguments for the program itself. We will import time in order to pause our programs if we need to. We will import the getopt library in order to actually parse our options that we are going to use in our program. And also we want to import something new, which is from requests dot auth import HTTP digest auth. So let me just see before I uh, actually import this. Let me see whether it whether we can actually import it in the Python tool. So from requests dot auth import HTTP digest auth. 
so you can see everything works well it's already in the python 2 as it is a part of the actual requests library so nothing really there to worry about so let us just exit there just wanted to make sure before actually uh, starting this program so base or okay so this is our program so what we are going to do with this program is let us start off with a start function so let us just type here def start this function will take a different arguments and those arguments will be the actual arguments that we specify in our command now the command is something that we will run from our terminal so we want to actually make sure that we also parse those arguments such as url such as number of threads username and so on and so on to this actual function so in order to do that let's just use arg v which are our arguments let's add the two dots so we don't get the error and first thing that we are going to do is we're going to call a function called banner now this banner function is nothing really important it will just be a simple banner for our program we can call it right here just so our program can look a little bit prettier so print and we can just do something like this so three open quotes base or digest brute force auth doesn't even matter you can just type here anything you want basically and make sure to close these three single quotes and this is something that will actually get printed once we start our program so the user knows what they are running just as i said before nothing really too important what is important is as soon as the program starts before we actually do anything we want to check out whether the user of this program specified the correct number of arguments for example if we want to use three arguments for this program such as url the number of threads and the username let's say for example a user specifies only two of those we will not be able to run our program therefore we need to perform the check even before we begin doing anything else so in order to do that we can just use simple if statement so if length then open brackets if length of sys.argv uh, which is just the arguments in from our command is, le is lesser than 5 now the reason why we are using 5 is because we are going to have 5 different arguments first one will be the url the second one will be the actual username the third one will be the file from where we are going to use the password list so the two brute force the fourth one will be the method that we are going to use so you can see that we have base or digest brute force authentication we need to make sure that we know which method are we using and we also want to have a t option which is going to be an option for the thread so those are five so if length is if the arguments are lesser than five we want to print a function that we are going to call later or let's not print it you can print a function you can call a function which will call just usage this function will actually print how you can use the program but we currently don't really need it for now on if we it if the user specifies less amount of actual needed arguments we'll just quit the program right after printing or printing the usage of this program if that is not the case we will try to perform the get opt of those actual uh, different fields or arguments that the user specified so accept we'll try and we will accept a get opt error so get opt dot get opt error and we'll just print in that case error on arguments we can print it like this so two exclamation marks indicating an error add a space right here and close the double quotes and of course after that we want to also quit the program once again if it is not if it does work we will just use the opts and arguments as two different variables which will store the actual get opt dot get opt which is a function from the get opt library that we imported from these different arguments and right here what we need to actually specify are two different things first of all is the arguments themselves so argv as you can see we parse them to this start function right here and the second thing that we need to specify between the double quotes is the actual letters for these specific arguments so this is something that you can actually pick for yourself but for now on what we will use is for the username we will use u for the url we will use w 
or pardon me, you do not actually need to separate it with sla uh, with the comma, you separate it with the two dots, so U, W, uh, for the actual file containing our passwords, we will specify simply F as a file, for the method we will use M, and for the threads we will use T, so simple as that. Okay, so let us continue with our program. Right now what we are going to do is we are going to use for each option and argument in this opts actual variable that we created right here. So we will iterate over this. What we want to do is check out if for example option equals equals to uh, dash u then we will actually set the user variable to be equal to argument. So the argument will be something coming after the, the dash u. So that is something that we will store in the username. So since that will actually be a username itself. Else if the option equals equals to uh, dash w, this is a URL. So we will just type here URL equals arg. Now we need to do the same for each option. So else if op equals equals dash f. We need to type here dictionary dictionary equals argument next thing else if opt equals oops else if opt equals equals to the dash m what we want to type right here is that the method equals argument and the last one else if opt equals equals dash t we will print right here threads equal arc so these are all our options covered. Uh, basically what we are going to continue in the next lecture is basically running this program. We're going to have a function that is going to launch our threads on these different passwords from the file. We also need to open that file and read from it. So that is something that we'll do in the next lecture. Uh, we just started off our program for now, on, which is more than enough for the first lecture. And we will continue coding in the next tutorial. So hope you enjoyed it and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial. Or if you want to our second tutorial of our base or digest authentication brute forcer. So what we did for now on is we only specified a few different arguments that we're going to parse to this uh, actual program in order to separate a few different things that we will need in order to run this. So right now the next thing we want to do after specifying the arguments is try to open the file that the user has specified as a password list or as a dictionary. So we can do that with simply try and accept rule. So what we are going to try is as usual try to open that file. So f equals open. We can call it just like that. What we are opening is this variable right here. Since you remember the actual argument containing the, containing the name or the path to the file is set to be in this variable right here. So we are opening that path dictionary. We are open it of course for the reading since we want to read from it. And then what we are going to do is we'll just set the passwords to be equal to f.readlines which is a function that we can use to read lines from this file. In other case we'll just print the error so you can just print it like this. File doesn't exist. And you can just type please check the path or please check if the path is correct. You can just print something like that, doesn't even matter. What matters is that we actually close the program right after this, since there is no point in continuing, since that actual program does, uh, pardon me, that actual file doesn't exist. The next thing we want to actually do is make a function which we'll call launcher threads and which we will actually call after this. So we want to call it right here, launcher underscore threads. And what that function will take as an input are all five arguments from our actual uh, program. So what it will take, it will take passwords. Now make sure that you not actually specify the dictionary as we already take, uh, took care of that part right here. Uh, we basically opened it and we read lines, stored it in passwords variable or list, however you want to call it. And then we are going to parse passwords to our function, no longer dictionary. So the next thing we want to parse to this is the threads 
we can parse the method or let's go with the user first then the url and then the method so basically we are parsing our five arguments all we are left to do right now is to actually code the function itself so let us code it right here def launcher underscore threads it needs to take the same input so passwords th for threads username for username url and method these are four arguments that this function will take. Now what this function will do is it will actually manage the threads for our program. So we will need to create a list that is going to kind of take a track of these actual threads whether uh, if for example the number of threads is smaller than the threads we specified we will need to run a different thread. If it is not we will have to close threads and so on and so on. Now, how we are going to specify this? Well, first of all, we are going to cre create a global variable, the i, which we are going to use not only in this function, the, but also in other functions as well. The reason for that is because it is a global variable, we will need it. So let us just type here global i. And this i is not really a variable, it is going to be a list rather. So right here, and this list will actually have our... Uh, threads. So in order to start off let us append i.append0 and you will see just in a second why. And what we want to do next is while the length of our passwords which is the passwords that we specified or that we got from our dictionary while it exists so while we are not hitting the end of the file if hit equals equals to 1 and before you say right now well what is hit well, hit is a variable that we are going to call at the beginning of our program and we will set its value right at the beginning. So we can go just up here. We will call it global hit and we will set it to be equal to 1. Now, what this variable basically does is if you code it right here, if hit equals equals to 1, that means that we need to actually uh, continue running our program. And then if we find a pass password for our actual uh, website or basic authentication, however you want to call it, we will set this hit variable to be equal to zero. And therefore this part of program, which is a while true loop, or pardon me, not while true, while length loop, is going to stop executing. Then that's what we want, because this is the part of our program that's actually running the threads. This is basically some kind of a flag for this actual function right here. What we're going to try right here is if i and then the first element of our list is smaller than th and you can see that we appended to our actual i the zero so the first element will be zero so if the first element is smaller than th we want to create the password variable to be equal to passwords.pop pop zero let me just show you what I'm doing right here. And then our i, the first element, will be equal the current first element, which is in our case at the first iteration 0. Let me just find where 0 is. Okay, so here it is. And then we will just add 1, which means that we are going to start one thread right now. So we want to add uh, the number 1 to the actual list in order to keep the track of these threads right here. So, and then we create the thread, as I said, so thread equals request underscore performer, which is a function that we will call in just a second. This is basically a function that will uh, brute force the uh, basic authentication. So this is actually the main function itself. Uh, we will code it in the next video. For now, let us just call the thread itself. This function will take an input from the password, username, username, URL and method. Now make sure to call it the same as you called it right here when you actually parsed those different arguments right here. And all you want to do is start the thread. What this will do is it will start the thread and it will now this i uh, list right here will contain one which will mean one thread is started and then it will continue just going through this loop while there is still passwords remaining in this current list. We will just accept this, so if we keyboard interrupt it, since there is really no other way that we can actually interrupt this instead and that it actually closes well, 
we will just print interrupted and we will close the actual program so simple as that interrupted and we will sys dot exit the program make sure that after this once you actually uh, finish this part right here you want to join the thread so thread dot join open and close brackets and that would be actually everything for this function right here this is how we are going to manage the threads now once again let me just remind you that this hit variable is just a flag that we are going to set in our request performer function that we are going to code in the next video to be equal to zero once we actually hit the password or find the password however you want to say it then this function right here launcher threads can actually stop executing so that would be about it for this tutorial. We will call this function in the next tutorial and I hope I see you there. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back. And before we actually continue with this program, I just want to correct myself because in the previous video, I just watched the ending of the video and I was referring to this request performer as an actual function. It is not a function, it is an actual class that we are going to create right now, which will take, uh, which will have a function in it that is going to run the brute forcing itself. So I didn't actually explain myself really well in the previous video. Once again, it is a class, not a function. So let us continue coding it. These are just the self arguments that the actual class will take and that the run function will actually use in order to perform the brute forcing. Now you will see just in a second what I'm talking about. Let us go up here and we can code it right here, for example. So let us name it the same so class request underscore performer and make sure that this actual uh, class right here doesn't take an input of these fields right here these are just the variables or the arguments that we are going to pass to the init function in the class request performer what this request performer will take as an input is the thread itself so let me just show you right here thread request underscore performer and basically first thing you need to code in every actual class is the init function which will take which where you will actually define your different variables so def underscore underscore init underscore underscore it will take an argument of self which is a usual for the classes in python name user url and method let me just check if those are the four that we specified right here. Username, password, URL, method. Yeah, those are the exact four that we specified. And what we want to do right now is actually define these variables or self variables with the actual variables themselves. But before we do that, we need to create a thread object in it with the actual self in the bracket specified. So in it and then self. And then afterwards we can proceed to the self.password equals name.split. Let me just go right here. The to actually split it by the uh, new line character and take the first element of that, which will be the password itself. As you can see, uh, the name is the actual password, so it doesn't really we don't need to call it name, we can just call it passwords. Or pass, doesn't really matter. Okay, let's call it pass wd because pass is already a uh, defined actual function in the Python itself. So we'll just use this pass wd dot split. We'll take the first element, which is going to be the password itself, cell dot username will be equal to the user specified cell.url can be equal to the url itself so cell.url equals url the method will also be equal to the method and we can print which password are we currently trying so we can just do something like this cell.password and we can add the actual another dash right here this is just going to print the current password that we are going to try. And now we are doing the main part of the program itself, which is the run function. Now this run function, as I said before, is going to check for the actual methods. And if the method is basic, it will perform the basic requests for the basic authentication. And if the method is digest, 
or specify this digest will perform the HTTP digest authentication with the request library. Now it is rather simple so don't really worry, it is nothing really to worry about. Def run. Every function in the class has to take a self object so we can actually parse these different variables to the function in the class. We will right here use the global hit variable which we coded at the beginning of the program itself which is currently set to 1 and right now what we're going to do is first of all we will check whether it is still set to 1 so if hit or our flag is set to be equal to 1 we'll try to actually take the method itself whether it is a basic or the digest authentication so what we will try is we will do something like this so if self.method equals equals to basic we are going to do our equals requests dot get and what we are going to specify in these brackets right here is the URL of course since we need to actually type here which URL are we going to visit and get the response from and we need to specify the authentication which will take the arguments of the username and the password so self.url dot comma self.url and then comma auth will be the authentication then open and close another brackets and here specify the username and the password. So self.username comma self.password. So right here this is all set to go. Let me just double check everything. So we specify the URL, we specify the username and password and then we can proceed else if self.method is equal to the digest method then we want to actually perform r equals requests dot get on the same url but this time the actual authentication will be equal to http digest auth so we're using this type of authentication which also takes two different arguments which is just the username so self.username and the password itself password make sure to close another bracket at the end of this statement and what we are going to do is we are going to check right now for the actual status code of the page that we actually load afterwards now what this means if we get a status code of 200 that means that we found the password what we will do is we will set the hit variable or flag to be equal to zero and that will close our program we will print the password of course before we actually close the program and in case the status code is not equal to 200 and basically as I said before the status code 200 means that we successfully loaded the page so if the status code is not equal to 200 we will continue to the next password and we will actually remove the thread from our counter which is in the launcher threads function right here and our counter is basically this i list right here which is containing different threads or not containing it's actually keeping track of those threads we will just remove one from this list right here so we can actually keep a good track of it and let us see how we can actually implement all of that so first of all as I said let us go right here we want to check for the status code now we made a request or the r variable to contain the response from this request so if r dot status underscore code which is an actual thing that we can check with the request library equals to 200 we can set the hit to be equal to zero and we can print then so print like this password found and then dash and then uh, the uh, double quotes plus self dot password which will print the current password that got the status code of 200 and after we print it we can close the actual program with sys.exit in any other case which will be the case that we get any other status code we will just print not valid password two dots space and then we will add plus self dot password and make sure to not quit it right here you want to before we actually continue to the next password we want to remove the thread from the actual counter which we can do with this statement right here minus one which will just remove the actual which will just perform the 
subtraction uh, from our actual list or the first element of our list, removing the thread itself. Now make sure that before we actually close this program and wrap it up, that we actually uh, run the accept rule as well. So we try this and if that doesn't work, for some reason we will accept any error. So accept exception E, we can print that error to see what that error is about. So this is basically the main part of our program. What we will do in the next video is we will just actually uh, define this usage function. Let me just see where did we put it. I believe it is some, somewhere right here. We check for the arguments. Okay, so here it is. We will actually define this usage function, which we still don't have. It is just printing some string statements, how to use this program and so on and so on. And then I will show you how fast this program can actually brute force. So hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one. Bye. Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial and let us now finally code our usage function which will just print to the user how they need to use this program which will take the arguments or the function itself will not take the arguments but it will print the arguments and it will print what each letter of the specified arguments right here that we set up right here means because user cannot really see this code. So we want to make sure that they actually know what they are doing before running this program. So we can call the usage function right below the banner. So def usage, open double quotes, uh, pardon me, open and close brackets, and then the two dots. And we'll just print something like this. So print usage two dots. In the next line, we can actually, first of all, use the, uh, let me just check right here the w which is for the url so we can just use that one first we can tab it slash or dash w uh, two dots will be equal to the url and then for example we can just specify in the brackets http slash slash uh, random website dot com now, of course, you need to actually specify a slash for the actual, or it's not really that important. Just make sure that they know uh, how to specify a website. Since if you remember in the previous videos, we specified the HTTP by ourselves. And right now we didn't do that. So we need to specify to the user that they need to add the HTTP tag as well. But before I close these double quotes, let me add the bracket right here. And the next thing that we want to actually print to the user would be the username so dash u i believe is the username simple as that nothing really too much to explain right here it is the username that the user will specify then the next thing is the number of threads so minus t i believe is the number of threads yeah it is minus t so threads afterwards we can print the file that the user needs to specify in order to brute force which is the file containing the actionary, the actual password, so dictionary, dictionary file, let's type it like this. And the last thing that we need to print is the method that the user will use, so minus m, two dots, and then the method. In brackets, we can specify basic or digest. So simple as that. And the last part will be a simple usage or a simple example of this program, of using this program. So example, so example, we can call it like this. So base or digest auth dot py minus w http some uh, double slash uh, random website dot com then minus u admin minus t five for the five threads and minus f we can just type passwords dot txt so this is a simple uh, example of actually com uh, of a command that will run this program so we print that to the user as well and right now if i'm not mistaken this is everything we need to specify for our program and right now we can see how it will run we can see how fast it will actually brute force the password. We'll just use some random list. It doesn't even matter. We just want to see how fast it goes, whether these threads help us. 
and whether we actually printed everything as we should. So let me save this. chmod plus x base or digest authentication. Now let us just first of all just start by running the actual program. So let me just see right here, print this, file doesn't exist, to check if the path is correct. And here we have an actual bracket right here, which we don't need. So let is just nano the base or digest. Let me just find where that is. Here it is. First of all, we don't need this bracket and we don't need this bracket right here. So that is first error. Let us see if we have anything else. You can see nothing really gets printed out, which is weird. Let us just type here, hello. Not really sure why the usage is not being printed out. Let me check something first. If length of the sys arguments is equal, we will call usage. Okay, so why didn't you call usage then? Oh yeah, of course. This is like a huge mistake, or oh, not a huge mistake, it's just something that we should actually have noticed that we didn't even call anything in our program. Of course, nothing will be ran since we didn't call the function itself. So we will use if name equals equals to main. We'll run our start function. We'll try to run it to so start and make sure to specify that it should actually run from the second element of our list of arguments and then till the end. So close the square brackets, close the normal brackets, and we will just, let me just see right here, we don't need here a square bracket, so here is a normal bracket, here is a square bracket, okay, and we will accept keyboard interrupt, and we will print interrupted. So just like that, and right now we actually call the function itself and we can see we get the actual uh, banner which we will fix right now so this has to be tabbed just like this so let us say right now and once again once we run it we get the banner and afterwards we get the usage since we didn't specify any actual uh, argument right here so let us see how we can specify the argument so basic base or digest authentication then dash w and we will specify for example my router for the actual basic authentication so 192.168.1.1 which is the IP address of my router minus u admin and minus t number of threads will be 5 and we forgot right here to specify the method itself so nano base or digest authentication and right here dash m method so simple as that oops okay so minus w http slash slash 192.168.1.1 uh, minus u for the actual username minus t for the uh, number of threads minus f for the actual uh, file list or dictionary so we'll just use the common.txt since it is in this actual directory and minus n we can just type here basic please check if the path is correct file doesn't exist let us see why the file doesn't exist it should exist so what we do afterwards file equals open dictionary for reading okay let me just find okay so opt minus f dictionary equals arg and then f equals open dictionary for reading weird not really sure why it won't work or maybe it has to do something with the method itself not really quite sure Let's try something like this. If I just set the method at the beginning to be equal to basic and I run it without this, B 
paste or digest authentication. What was my command? Let me just double check everything. So file command.txt. Let us go back to our program. So something is wrong, not really sure what, but we will manage to fix it, I believe. So dash u dash m dash t. Okay, so why doesn't the file exist? Let us see. We just type here ls, command.txt is there. Let's try with a different password list. Maybe that password list doesn't exist. What, we, what if we specify the entire path? So slash root slash Python program slash brute forcer and then the passlist.txt. For some reason it doesn't want to work even then. File doesn't exist. Which is really weird because that is the actual part of the program that I believe works really well. F equals open dictionary. Dic oh, okay, so here is the error. We are missing a letter right here. Not here, dictionary. That was the actual problem. So right now if we run this, if we run it without the full path, what do you mean? Let me just check everything right now. Maybe I named it once again. Dictionary. Dictionary. Is this the same word it is? So dictionary. Let's just try to change the order for some reason. Maybe that could be presenting the problem. Then threads 5, then M basic. And then we run this object has no attribute password. Okay, so we got a different type of error. That is actually good. Let us see. Okay, so the error is right here. Pass, we are having an extra R right here. So let us try right now. Pass WD. Then what is the name if it is not pass WD? Oh, so it's password. Password. Okay. Too many errors, but that is something that you will encounter a lot. Not hello world, not valid. Okay, so we got our program to work, finally. Not valid password, not valid password, not valid password. Let us just right now try to actually use a password list that is a little bit lo longer, which is common.txt. And my username is not even admin, so it doesn't even matter. We can just go and you can see it actually brute force really, really fast. For an online brute forcer, this is actually really good. We can see that it works, we don't get any errors anymore. We had to deal with a few errors, but we managed to fix it, so everything is good. And our program finally works. So that would be about it for our basic or the digest authentication brute forcer. We're going to continue coding in the next lecture, and I hope I see you there, and take care. Bye! Hello everybody and welcome back to this tutorial which will also be a last tutorial for us. Now we what we are going to do in this tutorial is we are going to take a look at a ransomware that is coded in the Python. Now the reason why we are not coding our own ransomware is because there really is no point. We are only looking at this one out of the educational purposes just to see how it looks like and how we can actually implement it somewhere if we actually wanted to. But once again, there is no reason to do that. I cannot think of an actual uh, possible legit reasons or legal reason to use ransomware anywhere. We are only taking a look, look at it out of the educational purposes. So this one is actually called Python. Uh, you can get it on the, let me just see the Python. You can get it on the actual uh GitHub repository, so it, it was coded by someone else, and this is just the tool that they, that they came up with. So you can see that right here we have uh, three different tools, I believe. One of them is the ransom server.py, one of them, is the second one is the ransom payload.py, and the third one is the decryption tool.py. Now we can take a guess at what each one of them do, but first of all, 
Let us take a look at the Ransom Payload, since that is the actual program that will get delivered to the target machine. So Ransom Payload, Ransomware Payload.py And this is the actual program. Now once again this is not the program that I coded, this is the program downloaded from the actual uh, GitHub repository. So we can see, let us go line by line and see what this does. So first of all it creates a socket object, it performs a connection to a specific IP address, which it's for for sure going to be the IP address of the actual server part of this code. Then we have a few strings right here, such as hello and exit, or pardon me, enter and exit string. We first of all send the enter string, as we can see right here. We print the receiving, so I believe that the server will actually send something back. And we, the server will also send the key, which we will use in order to encrypt. As we can see, sock.receive, and we are receiving the key. The key is then being printed out, and then we are sending the sock.send, exit, and then I believe they will close the connection, as here sock.close is performed. I believe same will be performed in the server side of the code as well. Now we can see that here we also have a file encrypting function, basically, that says don't touch anything. I believe this is a function that will encrypt everything except the actual uh, payload or ransomware itself, as we can see right here, if name equals or if name is not equal to the ransomware.py, then you open any file, read its data, you create this key, and then basically you encrypt the file and name and add it dot encrypted to that file extension. Then we can see we open encrypted file, write by this file, and then you write the encrypted content of that specific file. And then you remove the file itself so that there really isn't a copy of that file there. Let me just see, then we get the accept error which says not permitted, so this will be for all the files that the user doesn't have or that this program doesn't have access to, which in case this is running as a user it will not encrypt any files that are for example system files and something like that. Now before I actually uh, finish this let me just tell you that uh, this program is not something you should run on your own PC. I didn't try it out, I'm not really sure what it exactly it will do. I mean, I have a guess it will encrypt all your files, but uh, if you already want to test this, you can test it on a simple virtual machine and see how it will work there. Now that we got it out of the way, uh, let us see what this file, this the function will do right here. So we can see in a list, we have different extensions for files. Most of them are right here. And basically what I'm guessing is that this will search through all the actual, yeah, it will search through the C drive for these types of files, and if it finds it, then it will encrypt those files. As we can see, it is calling this function file encrypt. I believe Anne is missing right here. And here is the function that we already passed. The first function that is called is this file is function, as it says executing the ransomware, and then you change the actual directory to the desktop, not really sure why, and this part right here is something that really isn't needed, so we can actually hash this, I believe. Well, let's just leave it there, it doesn't even matter. It is something that isn't really part of this code, I believe. So that is the part of the actual payload. It is rather simple, as we can see, we are receiving some messages from the server, which we'll, we'll take a look at right now. And then we simply just encrypt every actual file that is with the extension in this list. So let us take a look at the actual server, so nano ransom underscore server dot py. Okay, so we can see some cryptography library is being imported right here. The salt value is also being added in the key generation as we can see right here. Some algorithms, they use the uh, SHA-256. We can see length 32, salt is equal to the specified salt in this variable right here, and the number of iterations is, let's just say, a lot. So we can see this is really well uh, encoded, so there is not really an actual way for the uh, target to decrypt those files without knowing the actual key. You can see some of the actual messages being exchanged with the target and the server, as we can see we are receiving those two messages such as enter and exit from our payload and then we are closing the connections once the encryption has started on the target system. 
down here it is just a while true loop that will perform the actual connection with the target itself. So nothing really too hard right here except this part it might be new to you. It is basically the creation of this actual key and the decryption tool which is the last thing that we are going to look at is the decryption tool is this basically uh, I believe this program will just decrypt all of your files that we just see, input anterior key file location, so it will search for the key into, uh, in order to be able to decrypt, you can see key file.read, file close, import OS, my list, and then it will just print, or it will just use this decrypt function, let me just see where it is called, okay, so here is the decrypt function, and this will just basically use that key that we specified in the server itself to decrypt all of these actual files. And it will add an extension dot decrypted. So that is my guess on what this program will do. As I said before, I haven't really tested it. So this is just a simple look at the actual ransomware. When with this we are actually concluding our entire course. So we took, it is a rather beginner course, but we also took a look at some of the advanced topics such as coding the advanced backdoor, coding the keyloggers, coding the brute forcers and so on and so on. So basically there is something for everyone in this course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that you will learn something from this and that it actually helped you with your further career. If you want to pursue penetration testing or ethical hacking or just Python in general, this actual little course can help you do that. So, so thank you for sticking till the end in this course with me. Once again, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're going to have a great day. Take care. Bye.